have this budget $100 million going towards the first year funding for Measure J. Thank you to Sheila uh, for your advocacy for that. And again, having the courage to put it uh, before us, to put on the ballot. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're all so proud uh, of that. Um, and yes, this is the largest uh, allocation that we've ever uh, proposed. Uh, to to invest uh, in in programs like this, but I do know that uh, uh, you know it's never going to be enough uh, because there were so many years uh, you know that that in, this kind of investment was not made in our communities, and I think we've unfortunately reaped the negative benefits of, of that um, as it relates to um, incarceration, uh, more people in our jails. Uh, more people who uh, really could have used the help a long time ago uh, as investment in their lives. Uh, and I, I talked to Fisia yesterday, and I'm, I'm going to say it again. I really want to challenge you to um, identify, uh, I would hope, another $50 million in the next phases of the budget process. I know we have two other phases after this, and I really hope you can identify that so that we really – um, have a, a, a even bigger chunk of money that we begin to invest um, in these um, initiatives that, that matter so much to each and every one of us. And I just think the more money we can invest up front, it's going to pay off on the back end. Um, we will get this investment uh, back in so many ways. So I, I'm hopeful that maybe you can identify that money in the next few uh, phases. Uh, we all want to see real change. I know we can achieve it, uh, but I I am too on the the Sheila Kuehl more, more, more <laughs> uh, bandwagon. Uh, I also uh, want us to look at consolidating office space um, and letting go of some of the leases that don't make sense anymore as we head towards this so-called new normal uh, we should and we, we, we can and we should implement uh, teleworking solutions long term that makes sense both uh, for our county staff, our county budget. Uh, that was an initiative that I, I thought about when I was chair, which seems like another lifetime ago, several years ago. But I thought it would, was time that we began looking at alternatives to people getting in their cars and driving downtown Los Angeles and showing up at, at one location to do their work. I think what this pandemic has showed us is that you know we can have different creative um, solutions to the workplace. And I, I hope we uh, focus more on the infrastructure, making sure people have the kinds of uh, uh, Wi-Fi, the networks, the infrastructure it takes um, to, to work from different places in the county of Los Angeles. And I, I uh, also want to look uh, at continuing to fund and expand our mobile stroke unit program, uh, which has achieved great outcomes. And I really want to thank my colleagues in the past for supporting the funding of this mobile so stroke unit, which really does save lives, um, prevents people from having the debilitating um, after effects of having a, a stroke. We have uh, data and reports now that prove uh, that it does work, it is efficient. And my goal someday, uh, colleagues, is to have this mobile stroke unit be able to service every corner of Los Angeles County. Um, I think that's the new um, cutting edge technology um, uh, of providing health care in the future. Um, let the hospital come to the person and uh, it will save more lives that way. Um, and I'll, I'm looking forward, Ficia, in the next couple of weeks, having you come back to us with um, recommendations of how we should allocate this $1.9 billion that we're being given through the Biden administration's American Rescue program. Uh, I, it is my hope that we'll use this money to strengthen, not just preserve, our county's social safety net um, to keep delivering those most in need. And with that, I yield back my time, Madam Speaker. I mean, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Next, we'll hear from Supervisor Barger. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank Fizia Davenport and the entire staff and all my staff, Rick Velasquez and, and my team 
um, for the hard work that's been put into developing the recommended budget that's being presented today. I'd also like to thank the department heads and, and really appreciate the work that they've done with their staff and their due diligence in helping us serve the residents of Los Angeles County, especially over this last year. Although the recommended budget is 36.1 billion, which is about 5% less than last year's budget, I really applaud the fact that um, it was developed prior to the final adoption of the American Rescue Plan, which tells me we have opportunities moving forward. Um, that plan, as you know, is expected to bring about 1.9 billion uh, in local fiscal recovery funds. And I believe that we have an opportunity to truly um, invest those funds in important programs that um, many have been outlined by my colleagues. I also want to um, recognize our employees and, and those that called in today um, regarding hero pay. And I hope, uh, uh, Fizia, that moving forward, we can look at ways to recognize and thank our employees, especially those um, that were holding down a full-time job and childcare and everything else that went with it. So I hope moving forward, we can uh, look at the hero's pay and how this county can in fact um, thank our employees for the work that they've done. I also want to thank you for including the um, issue as it relates to the mental outreach and triage, um, the recommendation that you're putting into the budget um, to augment uh, crisis and intervention services because we know with COVID, um, mental health is an area that needs to be um, in, in supported and we need to have a robust program moving forward. And I think it's important for us to invest in programs centering around the mental evaluation teams, as well as our host teams that are going out and doing outreach for our homeless um, population. Um, our, our financial situation continues to evolve and we have not yet seen the full impact of COVID-19 and its requisite uh, closures on our region. I am hopeful that as we move forward with reopening local businesses and organizations, county revenues will also increase and help stabilize our budget so that we can continue to provide the essential and recreational services our residents and communities expect and deserve. We are continuously reminded of the county's role in providing essential services for millions of our residents and support for thousands of businesses and organizations across the region during their time of need. The increase in the demand for county services such as food, housing, and health and mental health care is staggering. And I know um, as chair, I saw firsthand when we were doing the food um, giveaway out in my district, how many people are truly food, have food insecurity and I think we're gonna to have to continue to provide those support and resources moving forward. Unfortunately, we are also simultaneously seeing unparalleled reductions in revenues that are needed to fund vital services in child welfare, public safety, health, and mental health service in other areas. Several years ago, the board established and began regularly contributing to the Rainy Day Fund. I wanna commend my colleagues on this board for their fiscal prudence in setting aside money each year toward the Rainy Day Fund, which has been vital to help us ensure the continuity of needed services, which really was the bridge that got us through uh, the difficult period um, over the last year. We need to continue our practice of allocating money to the Rainy Day Fund to help us prepare for any future impacts. And I, I, look, I um, look forward to further updates from the CEO on these efforts. We, I, as we learn more about the impacts of COVID-19 on our revenues, and any additional federal assistance that may be forthcoming, we will likely need to make adjustments during budget deliberations in June. And I look forward to the opportunity to do just that. As part of that, I'd like to lay the groundwork to improve and enhance our mental health services in conjunction with public safety. In this year's budget, as I've noted, we are restoring funding to prevent cuts in both mental health evaluation teams and the homeless outreach teams. But I wanna see where we can do more, especially around substance abuse, um, I commend the County Fire Department for their program, which is the Advanced Provider Response Units, telemedicine unit, which goes out into the community and is providing services uh, when 911 calls are made and linking those individuals to services not only within the healthcare, but also within public social services. So I'd like to see this program rolled out and, and, and um, 
provided an opportunity to grow within the county. Right now it's in the Antelope Valley. I see opportunities to um, move that forward. Uh, and I think that that's something that, that this entire board um, would support. Again, I would just like to say that um, we all have tough decisions to make, but this board is united in the fact that we have an opportunity to invest in future programs that are going to change how we've done work. Um, I look at the program that I'm doing up in the Antelope Valley for Challenger, which is reimagining Challenger to be, uh, rather than a youth camp, it is going to be vocational youth workforce training program and housing. And it's an opportunity for us to take what was a, some would call prison, and make it into something that is going to truly benefit um, the entire LA County, but especially the Antelope Valley region. I'd also once again like to take a moment to thank our county workers, many of whom we've heard from today, who've gone above and beyond in serving our residents when they did it the most during this last year. Finally, I wanna thank my colleagues on this board for your collaboration and support as we weather these difficult times together. I really am grateful to work with each and every one of you in unison toward the best interest of all of our Los Angeles County residents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Supervisor Barger, and I wanna thank all my colleagues for all of your statements. And also again, thanks to our CEO, Pisa Davenport, her staff, all our budget deputies, and also all of our uh, public employees at service here in the county and provide such tremendous service and, and hope to so many people. So with that, um, again, thanks. I would now like to take this opportunity to read in an amendment to set Wednesday, May the 19th, 2021 as the date that public budget hearings will begin instead of May 12th, 2021. I, I would uh, also like to remind everyone, particularly those that did not get a chance to make a public live statement or comment on the budget today, um, just to remind you that the public budget hearing is another opportunity to provide that feedback. So you will have another, as they say, bite at the apple at the next meeting that we have uh, on the budget, which will be on uh, May the 12th. So item 46 as amended is before us, moved by myself and seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 46 as amended is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kiel. Aye. Supervisor Kiel, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, members. We will now take up public hearing item one, annexation and levying of assessments in the unincorporated areas of Azusa. West Whittier, Los Nietos, East La Mirada, Roland Heights, and Canola Mesa. I believe uh, Mark Pastrella, Director of Public Works, is available if there are any questions. Are there any supervisors that would like to make any remarks? Okay. okay. It would be uh, appropriate to close the public hearing and direct the tabulation of the ballots and table the item until later in the meeting for tabulation results and action by the board. That will be the order. Moving on to item two, public hearing on the proposed vacation of an alley in the unincorporated community of Whittier. Are there any supervisors that would like to make any remarks on this item? Okay, seeing none, item two is before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Madam Chair, it's appropriate to close the public hearing and vote on item um, two. Is before you, Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kiel? Aye. Supervisor Kiel, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll now take up public hearing item number four, hearing on the county code title 22, planning and zoning, Leona Valley Community Standards District update. Are there any supervisors that would like to make remarks on this item? Okay, seeing none, it would be appropriate to close the public hearing and vote on the item. 
Item four is before us, moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve the item. Exe Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item four is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Items approved. Uh, moving on, we'll now take up public hearing item five, hearing on county code, title 22, planning and zoning, Green Valley Community Standards District update. Are there any members that would like to be recognized on this item? Okay. Seeing none, it would be appropriate to close the public hearing and vote on the item. Item five is before us, Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Solis, to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item five is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you. That will be the order. Um, Members, now we will move on to the set matter on the public health order. This is a public opportunity for the board to discuss the closures and pandemic trends. Uh, we will hear from Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health, and Dr. Christina Galley, Director of Health Services. And uh, they can begin their presentation and then we'll go in the order of uh, members wanting to be recognized. So, thank you. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you and, and good morning. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Solis and to the entire Board of Supervisors for this opportunity to discuss our ongoing progress in reducing COVID uh, transmission rates and increasing vaccination efforts. Uh, your steadfast leadership and support has helped guide us through this pandemic and we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with fewer cases, deaths and hospitalizations and more people provided protection through vaccination. Today, I'll provide an update on these metrics, our current tier status, sector reopenings, and compliance data, school reopenings and outbreaks, and the latest efforts on vaccinations. Uh, I know the public can't see the slides, but beginning with our first slide, our metrics continue trending in the right direction. Starting with our daily numbers, we're very sad to report 33 additional deaths today and 360 new cases. As always, we extend our deepest sympathies to everyone who has lost a loved one during the pandemic. There are 465 people currently hospitalized with COVID-19. This first slide shows our trend lines in cases, hospitalizations and deaths from March 1st of 2020 last year through April 11, 2021. As you can see, case numbers have stabilized over the past few weeks. On April 11th, we saw 414 daily average reported cases, and this is down 98% from the almost 16,000 cases we were witnessing at the peak of the surge. Hospitalizations have decreased now, as you noted, to 465 people today. This is down about 95% from the peak daily average of over 8,000 hospitalizations a day during the surge. And on April 11th, we reported seven daily average deaths, and this is down again almost 100% from a peak of 274 uh, during the surge. We're encouraged that the continued stable case rates and our daily test positivity rate, which averages about 1%, uh, suggests true progress in slowing transmission. And if you go to the second slide, uh, you can note that our tier status uh, on the state safer blueprint for safer economy has us remaining in the orange tier. I do run a report that the state just released the new metrics and our, uh, our metrics uh, shifted slightly uh, downward uh, for LA County. Our case rate is now 2.7 new cases per 100,000 residents. The seven day overall average daily test positivity rate is now down to 1.2%. And the test positivity rate in our lowest quartile uh, healthy places index communities is now at 1.5%. Uh, 
the state will post uh, has posted these updated metrics um, and as uh, I noted uh, will remain uh, in the orange tier for now in order to drop to the less restrictive yellow tier we would have to meet the threshold of an adjusted case rate of less than two new cases per hundred thousand and if you move to the next slide you'll note we did release a new health officer order effective April 15th uh, that reflects additional activities permitted in the orange tier. This includes indoor and outdoor live events and professional sports, private events, including meetings, receptions, and conferences, and informal gatherings, all with required safety modifications. This slide shows the many protocols that we've updated or issued to reflect changes, including new guidance for informal social gatherings. We've distributed these protocols to the many different sectors uh, that now are allowed um, some modifications on the safety measures, and they're also available for everyone on our website. We do know that when these protocols are implemented with fidelity by businesses and other entities, we can keep our work sites, employees, customers, and the community safe. I want to acknowledge that as I visited a number of our large event venues last week, I was tremendously impressed with all the efforts being made by staff and owners to adhere to the required safety measures, ensuring that spectators are spaced appropriately apart to maintain physical distancing, and asking and ensuring that all spectators are wearing masks unless they're eating or drinking in appropriate areas. I also want to thank the, span, the fans at the sporting events and the live events for doing their part to follow the safety directors, directives and to keep their masks on. It is great to be able to enjoy these activities again. And I know that it's taken a lot of adjustments and hard work for this to happen. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. I do wanna provide an update on our compliance efforts. Uh, and this slide shows a snapshot of our activities this past week and the results of health officer order inspections by our environmental health inspectors who are out in the field seven days each week to ensure that workers and the public are protected. At the more than 1,000 restaurants, bars, gyms, hair salons, food markets, and personal care services visited between April 12th and April 18th, compliance ranged from about 70% to 100%, depending on the sector. Most establishments are following the public health protocols and we thank all the businesses and patrons for working hard to adhere to the reopening measures. We do continue to see pockets where compliance is lacking and this non-compliance for significant violations includes a lack of physical distancing, employees not protected uh, by wearing face coverings and or shields and uh, a lot of examples uh, where the occupancy limits are exceeded. We'll take our next slide. While public health's approach is to educate establishments about the public health orders, citations are issued when there's a significant violation from the legally enforceable public health protocols. Citations were issued in less than 1% of inspections for each sector, with a total of 13 citations issued this last week for restaurants, five for bars, two for gyms, and one each for personal care services and food markets. Given the rise in cases happening in other parts of the country, we cannot afford to be complacent after our communities have already suffered so much. And while in the past, high rates of transmission on the East Coast have translated a few weeks later to increases in cases in LA County, I don't believe this pattern is inevitable. Our circumstances are vastly different now than they have been in the past because we have millions of residents and workers vaccinated and much higher compliance with health officer orders. However, to maintain the gains we've made, we do need to continue to take care of ourselves and each other, especially as we're reopening many sectors and enjoying many activities. I'll take the next, oh, you can flip to the next slide. Uh, one of the sectors that has been bringing many people back to their buildings are our schools. It's been more than two months since many of our schools have begun bringing back students for in-class instruction with a staged reopening. Currently, 77% of public school districts are open, as are 43% of private and charter schools. Uh, this results in more than 1,600 schools open for in-classroom instruction. 
an additional five public school districts and 113 private and charter schools have approved plans for reopening. On random site visits from the LA County Department of Public Health Schools Technical Assistance Team, school compliance with DPH safety protocols was extraordinarily high. Half of all the schools visited had perfect compliance, while an additional 45% had higher than 80% compliance with the many reopening protocols. This is great news for our students and our school staff, and we appreciate the hard work of everyone in our schools to keep each other safe and healthy. I'll go on to the next slide, uh, which shows trends over time for COVID cases among staff and students in K-12 schools from September of last year through mid-April of this year. As we reopen our schools again, many people are probably wondering what role schools play in the transmission of this infection. Going back to September 2020, when a very small number of schools started reopening, the orange line tracks the number of cases among all school staff by week, while the blue line represents the number of student cases by week. There are a couple of important points to highlight. The first is that among children, cases were generally much lower than among school staff until very recently. The second point is that case rates, case numbers among adults working in public schools corresponded not to the case numbers of children attending school, but to the cases in the community. And as you can see from the trend line among school staff, which spiked around the winter surge. With many more schools opening since February, it's encouraging to note the relatively few cases among staff and students. This does point to the effectiveness of the tools being used to create safety at all of the buildings. Even though they're fairly simple, masking and social distancing really work. When it comes to COVID, students and staff have a lot of protection at schools as long as safety protocols are followed and community transmission rates remain low. You may remember that we began vaccinating educators on March 1st. Something subtle has been taking place over the course of March that we're also seeing persisting through the first half of April. Since we began vaccinating educators for the first time, we've seen slightly more cases among students attending school than among staff. This is something new and different. And what it suggests is that among school staff who again, contract COVID mostly from exposures in their communities, the vaccination efforts are having a measurable impact. I do wanna thank our partners at the LA County Department of Education and at all the district and independent schools for their persistence and hard work, protecting the extraordinary staff and teachers and all our children. And I'm sure I'm joined by many, many parents in expressing our gratitude. Uh, some additional reasons to be hopeful are on the next slide about school reopenings comes from data on school outbreaks. As you can see from this graph of K-12 school outbreaks from the beginning of the school year in September through April 15th, we have only seen a handful of outbreaks in schools since the surge. And if you go to the next slide, in fact, of the five acute, of the five active outbreaks in LA schools right now, all are associated with participation in youth sports, not with attending instructional school activities. We know that masking and distancing are a challenge in sports and that socializing during these activities off school campus could be a factor in viral transmission among these groups. We're looking hard at the current guidance for youth sports and maybe making additional recommendations later this week to mitigate these increases in transmission among youth sports participants. And now I do want to uh, provide a quick update on vaccination efforts. Uh, so if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, yesterday did mark a significant milestone nationally as those 16 and older nationwide are now eligible for vaccination. And the CDC has reported that more than half of all American adults over the age of 18 or almost 131 million people have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine and 33% or more than 85 million are now fully vaccinated. In LA County, we're also making substantial progress, although we do have much work to do to ensure that those in our hard hit communities are easily able to get vaccinated. As of yesterday, we've administered over 6.3 million total doses in LA County with more than 4 million first doses and over 2.2 million second doses. 
This means that more than 4 million people have some additional protection against COVID and over 2 million people have the full protection offered by these highly effective vaccines. More than 74% of residents 65 and older have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 59% are now fully vaccinated as of April 16. We'll take the next slide. While gaps continue to exist in vaccination rates by race and ethnicity, with the highest rates among whites and Asians, we are making some progress getting more vaccinations into the communities hardest hit by COVID-19. For example, the relative percentage increase in vaccination rates from February 9th to April 9th for those 65 and older was 153% for Black and African Americans, 120% for Latinx residents, 115% for American Indian and Alaska Native residents, 68% for white residents, and 74% for Asian residents. The higher percentage increases in our hard hit communities are important and need to be continued in order for us to close the gaps we continue to see in vaccination rates by race and ethnicity. You can go to the next slide. For those 16 and older, vaccination rates overall are much lower as eligibility to be vaccinated just recently opened for many individuals in the younger age groups. We see some inequities in coverage rates though. And again, the gaps, however, are starting to narrow. We're in a crucial race to get many more residents and workers in all hard hit communities vaccinated as quickly as possible to prevent further spread of the virus and of the variants of concern. Strategies for improving vaccination rates among residents in hard hit communities include the following. First, increasing the number of doses allocated to providers serving those in the hard hit communities. This week, 73% of the doses distributed through the Department of Public Health's county network are to providers administering vaccine to those in hard hit communities. Second, we do have staff that are now assigned to support onboarding new providers that work in our hard hit communities so that they can get registered with the state and federal vaccination system. This would allow them to be able to vaccinate and it would increase access to local and trusted providers who can provide the vaccine in areas that are close to where people are living and working. Third, we are expanding our mobile teams so that they can pop up vaccination sites in partnerships with cities, community organizations, and houses of worship in those places that have the lowest vaccination rates. We'll go to the next slide. This table shows the summary of the weekly distribution of COVID-19 vaccines by site type. This week, there are 375 vaccination sites offering appointments with their portion of the almost 362,000 total doses that were allocated to the County of LA. We've brought new sites online, including Obregon Park in East LA, College of the Canyons in Santa Clarita, and Palmdale Oasis Park Rec Center in East Palmdale. Among the more than 100 mobile teams that are out this week, there are also mobile teams at the Palmdale and Lancaster Metrolink stations starting today. And I encourage residents and workers in these communities to take advantage of the new sites in Antelope Valley. Walk-ins are welcome at the Metro stations and the Palmdale Oasis Park Rec Center. As a reminder, this table does not include the doses that are allocated directly from the federal government to some county pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, nor does it include the doses that are allocated by the state to the large multi-county entities such as Kaiser and UCLA. Those sites add an additional 336 places where people can get vaccinated this week. Uh, and that brings us to a total of 711 sites across the county that are administering Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Johnson & Johnson vaccines are not being administered this week at any sites in LA County. We are expecting an announcement at the end of this week about the vaccine safety from the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. LA County will follow the CDC and FDA directives on when it's safe to resume administration of the J&J &J vaccine. We can go on to uh, your next slide. Uh, eligibility, as everyone knows, uh, expanded beginning April 15th for everyone 16 and older. This means that older teens 16 and 17 years old can now be vaccinated, adding an extra layer of protection that helps keep them safe and also helps keep their families, schools, sport teams, and communities safe. 
18, 16 and older can be vaccinated at any site that administers Pfizer vaccines. These sites include many of our county and city run large vaccination sites and hundreds of pharmacies, community vaccination events and health clinics, including those affiliated with major health systems like Kaiser, UCLA Health and the federally qualified health centers. Please note that we're asking young people 16 and 17 years old to come to their vaccination appointment with a legal guardian who can give a consent, just as we do when we give other pediatric vaccines. There are a number of ways to get a vaccine appointment in LA County. If you don't have internet access, you can't use a computer, or you're over 65 years old, please call us at 1-833-540-0472 for help finding an appointment. At times, there could be a, a long wait time, but uh, please uh, either hang on or leave us a number and we can get back to you. If you have internet access, please visit vaccinatelacounty.com for more information and links to sites where you can make your appointments. Uh, you can go to the next site. We do remain committed to increasing the number of vaccination sites and doses that are allocated in the hardest hit zip codes in LA County. This slide does show the progress we've made in increasing vaccine administration to those residents that live in these hardest hit neighborhoods. And it compares the percent of doses administered in the hard hit communities over the past two weeks. We increased the percent of people vaccinated in the hard hit communities to more than 50% of the total vaccines administered the second week of April compared to 47% the prior week. Now I've gone to the next slide. In addition to allocating doses to vaccine providers in hardest hit communities, mobile vaccine teams are also deploying to these areas, setting up more than 200 temporary vaccination sites over the next two weeks at senior ho housing developments, senior centers, houses of worship, and community-based organizations. Then go to the last slide. Public health is also working with many partners to vaccinate homebound residents. As directed by the board motion and the leadership of Chair Solis, public health developed an action plan to vaccinate homebound residents using diverse targeted approaches. We'll continue to deploy mobile teams to sites where residents with limited mobility reside. Since mid-February, mobile teams have vaccinated hundreds and hundreds of residents at over 380 senior housing sites. We're working with municipal fire departments to voluntary voluntarily vaccinate homebound residents in city jurisdictions, and we're using different strategies to identify homebound residents, including claims data and referrals from community partners, cities, and regional centers that provide services to homebound people. Municipal fire departments are also given an option to vaccinate homebound individuals identified by their own teams while following recommended homebound criteria provided by public health. Our team has also been working with health plans to ensure partnerships are in place to vaccinate homebound plan enrollees. Public health is collaborating with health plans caring for our Medi-Cal patients, LA Care, HealthNet, Molina, Blue Shield Promise, and Anthem Blue Cross, as well as commercial insurers as they are coordinating vaccination of their homebound patients. They estimate that they have 2,500 homebound patients, and this excludes those receiving dialysis who are getting vaccinated through a different route. Public health is allocating vaccines to support the excellent efforts of the LA County Sheriff's Department to reach homebound individuals, the majority of whom are adults with disabilities under the age of 65. Finally, public health is building on the education and outreach efforts of our community health workers to amplify messaging to reach homebound individuals and their service providers. Residents that are physically unable to leave their homes to go to a vaccination site can ring the call center at 833-540-0473 and let us know they're homebound and interested in being vaccinated. Again, this work, as all of our other vaccination efforts, is possible only because of the many partners and providers that have stepped up uh, to make a difference. Thank you again, supervisors, for all your support and the opportunity to speak with you today about our vaccination efforts, recovery journey, and sector reopenings, and all of the steps we're taking together to protect county residents at our workplaces, in our communities, and those participating in the activities we all cherish. 
I'm happy to answer your questions after Dr. Galley's remarks. Dr. Galley, you're on. Yes, thank you and good afternoon, supervisors. Today, I'll provide a brief update on vaccinations. Uh, DHS continues to prioritize our vaccination efforts while also balancing our ongoing need to ramp back up our regular health services, many of which, as you know, were put on hold uh, throughout the course of the past year with the pandemic and most notably in the surge that was in January uh, and February. If you'll go to the slides uh, on slide two, the first slide with data, slide two shows the overall vaccination rates and numbers that DHS has done since beginning vaccination efforts in mid-December. Uh, in total, DHS has provided approximately 140,000 vaccinations to date. The largest area of the chart is the bright blue, uh, and that corresponds to DHS outpatients. Uh, we also are uh, ramping up uh, vaccination efforts among individuals experiencing homelessness and the homeless service providers, as well as patients in correctional facilities. Uh, diving in a little bit more into that, that patient block on slide three, this shows progress by each type of vaccination, whether it's the first dose, second dose, or the Johnson & Johnson dose. Uh, as you can see here, based on the numbers, approximately 37,000 DHS uh, patients, 99% of whom were outpatients, have been fully vaccinated to date, and that includes about 4,000 patients who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. An additional 2,000 individuals received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as provided in correctional health services or by housing for health. And obviously, all J&J &J vaccines have been put on hold pending the outcome of the FDA and CDC's review of data with respect to uh, the, the blood clots that have been associated with those doses. Uh, we did convert uh, as many patient appointments as possible last week for patients who were scheduled to receive the J&J &J vaccine to receive either Pfizer or Moderna as supplies allowed. Some patients did need to be rescheduled and those were successfully rescheduled for appointments this week. Uh, we've also done individual outreach to the 5,800 patients who had received Johnson & Johnson vaccine through a DHS facility or staff. We did that through a variety of modalities, either in-person visits, uh, texting individuals through the use of our patient portal, through the website, and also through calls from or to our nurse advice line, uh, alerting patients that they did receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the warning signs of blood clots, and what to do if they have any concerns or questions. On the next slide, slide four, this looks at total vaccinated patients, uh, fully vaccinated patients versus partially vaccinated patients. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to the red line at the bottom, uh, which shows the individuals that are overdue for their second dose of vaccine. And you'll see that that number is very, very low. Uh, we've had really good success with getting uh, in contact with patients, scheduling them. They're scheduled at the time of their first appointment for their second appointment. And really great success rate with patients eager um, and on time coming back in for their vaccine with very low numbers who are overdue for their vaccination. And across the board, we continue to outreach to all DHS patients, anyone who's been seen in our system, including those patients who are impaneled to us, but also those who are not impaneled but receive other services with us to make sure that they receive a vaccination. And as I've mentioned before, these numbers only include the vaccinations that have been provided by DHS. Many DHS patients currently, um, we, we believe the number is about 20% still uh, of patients have received a vaccine from outside of the DHS system but the state system still do not allow us to do a bulk query to be able to obtain and receive updated numbers in that regard. The next set of slides on slides five through seven look at the vaccination rates among our impaneled patient population by race and ethnicity. Slide five shows the breakdown for the DHS population versus LA County overall. The majority of patients um, in line with who, who the patients are that we care for that are vaccinated are Hispanic and Latino. Second largest group is Black, African American, and then after that, Asian Americans. In looking at the progress by racial and ethnic group, look at slide six for the rates of those who are vaccinated uh, among those who are age 16 plus. And then slide seven looks at the population that is over age 65. And these slides demonstrate that the percent of our primary care patients who have received at least one dose of vaccine across the racial and ethnic groups broken down also by gender. 
we see consistently on both slides uh, for those over age 16 and over age, six, age 16 and over and age 65 and older that the rates are highest among uh, Hispanic and Latino patients and also among our Asian American patients and lowest among those individuals who identify as Black or African American, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander and our white patients. And, and that is consistent between the two categories We'll also see that in contrast to the data that I believe has been shown on the county and statewide basis, generally speaking, we have similar rates of vaccination among our male and our female patients. And in some groups, you'll see that we have even slightly higher rates of vaccine uptake among our male patients. Uh, and again, please remember that these numbers uh, represent the total percent of our impaneled patients that have come in for a vaccine with DHS but to consider or do a rough ballpark on the percent that has received a vaccination overall, then please increase these numbers by about 20%. Uh, that 20% number was drawn from a survey that was conducted about three weeks ago, and we're in the process of seeing if we can redo that survey, because certainly uh, the number has grown higher over the past three weeks. Slides eight and nine look at vaccination activity within Housing for Health Division for persons experiencing homelessness and the staff who serve them. Uh, obviously, DHS is just one of a number of uh, amazing uh, public and private partners who are actively serving this population, and this just re represents the volume delivered by the Housing for Health Unit. They've provided over 9,000 vaccines, about 9,000 vaccines to date, and the focus is equally distributed uh, intentionally between the sheltered and unsheltered PEH who are in encampments. Finally, um, on slide, sorry, on slide nine, you'll also see um, the racial and ethnic breakdown among persons experiencing homelessness overall versus the vaccinated share. Uh, and this is an area where obviously we still have work to do to be able to successfully outreach and engage with Black and African American persons experiencing homelessness as the vaccine success rate uh, is lagging in that area. And finally, on slide 10, we look at the progress among correctional health. About 7,000 vaccines have been provided to date uh, with 5,000 individuals fully vaccinated within the jails. Johnson & Johnson, um, about 16, 15 to 1,600 vaccines had been provided as of last week, and that is on hold, as I've mentioned. And the cumulative acceptance rate for vaccination is still consistently running at 55%, with just over half of the individuals in the jails uh, agreeing to be vaccinated. We continue to offer the vaccine to the individuals in jail and, and are working to get that acceptance rate up. Um, I want to thank the board for their ongoing support um, uh, throughout this pandemic and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much uh, to both of you, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Gal. You both have been so outstanding, and I think we can attribute um, the fact that we've, we've gotten to a better place because of the hard work that you and your staffs and our partners have been uh, undertaking for the last year. So I really want to applaud both of you for the work, tremendous work, but I know that our work's not done. And uh, just a couple of questions that I had with respect to um, Dr. Galley on uh, Housing for Health, on one of your charts there, uh, room key, project room key and participation of vaccinated sites. I, I still continue to get some calls from some of our uh, sites where they have not yet uh, arrived, so to speak. And I know we have a winter shelter out in uh, the Bassett area. I don't know that that facility has um, received any vaccinations. Uh, and then I'm, I'm just wanting to make sure that we really cover areas in the San Gabriel Valley, uh, because I mm -hmm. think that's really critical. As it is, our infrastructure, as you know, isn't, isn't what it is in other parts of the county. I'd really like to to see us uh, ramping that up more. And then are we doing anything, for example, uh, outdoors in terms of the watersheds, you know, in the canyons. And I know we have a big effort that goes on in Whittier Narrows, but I'm just wondering if <clears throat> that is something that we can try to coordinate as well to try to reach the homeless. Yeah, Supervisor, thanks for raising that. And um, I'll, I'll provide uh, the board offices with a list of the interim housing sites and the locations of the encampments that have been reached by the Housing for Health Unit. And there's a coordination team with all of the involved partners 
uh, including the Department of Public Health, LASA, several uh, community clinics uh, mm -hmm. who have divided up responsibility for the various shelters and encampment sites. Um, and if there's a particular location, you mentioned a couple that there's questions about, we can get you information about what the status is of outreach to that particular location and how we can expedite it. Right. And my second uh, question is for Dr. <clears throat> for Dr. Ferrer, with respect to, given um, the fact that uh, Johnson & Johnson has really, I think, impacted the psyche of a lot uh, in our community, a lot of folks, especially people of color, I'm starting to hear from some of our um, providers in our clinics, federally qualified clinics, that um, they have, they are not seeing people coming in. Uh, and the rates, I think, since last week, have been um, going down. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering, what is, what is our strategy then to try to make sure that we, you know, again, go out and insist in whatever way. Uh, to get these folks to get the other two vaccines as they're available because there is a large hesitancy, particularly I'm finding amongst um, our males, people of color, especially Latino, and I know I'm sure African American, but there's also some other other aspects to it. I understand also religious, that religious uh, values that are somehow impeding people's perception of, of uh, not taking uh, the vaccine. So can maybe you can address what strategies we're taking to help combat that, Doctor? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Solis. Uh, um, and and yes, um, I, I do think it's it's probably accurate to say uh, that in some communities, the news about the pause on the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, as um, the scientists are reviewing all of the data on a possible side effects, uh, has for some people, you know, raised some concern. Um, and you know, made them reconsider perhaps uh, their decision on getting vaccinated. Uh, we did a, a town hall uh, last week that was attended by tens of thousands of people and are planning another one, I think, for this Monday. Uh, we're also doing smaller events uh, in cities and towns where we just have you know speakers that are willing to be there virtually, obviously, and, and answer questions. Uh, and really try to provide as much information as possible on what the risks are and what the benefits are so that people can can understand how little risk these vaccines uh, actually pose to, to all of us as individuals uh, and how much gain uh, we have. You know, your risk of dying if you get sick, sick from COVID-19, uh, uh, infected with COVID-19 is about one, I think one in 56. and. Uh, your risk of having a, a serious clotting disorder, uh, as was noted uh, in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and not clear yet whether it's actually associated with the vaccination itself, uh, was about one in a million. Um, so, you know, when you, when you think about what, what we know about uh, what's in front of us right now, uh, we have a very deadly vaccine, a very deadly virus, and we have a very effective vaccine with, with relatively a few causes uh, for us to be concerned. But I do think everyone needs to get good information, needs to understand uh, exactly how rare these events are, and also needs to, you know, remember for themselves that uh, there are side effects with almost every medication that we take. Uh, and the job of the FDA is to make sure that we know what those side effects are so that providers can be prepared to treat people who may have a side effect, but also that so that people can understand uh, that you're taking a medication, even though you know it may have some side effects, because uh, the benefit of taking that medication is going to outweigh the risks uh, of having a side effect. Um, so we're we're going to need to be really good about giving this information to people in the many ways that people like to get information. And I think also what we learned from the town hall is being able to answer a lot of questions. People had really good questions. They need those questions answered. Uh, and we'll continue to just be as visible as we can and as available as we can over the next few weeks uh, to answer those questions. I do want to note that uh, at most of the sites, uh, but, you know, the vaccination appointments are filling up. Uh, the only place where we didn't fill at our county sites and, and you know, we're vaccinated, you know, over 100,000 people a week. Uh, is at the new sites that are just opening up 
uh, in uh, Palmdale and Santa Clarita. Uh, but we're going to work hard and I think get you know more information out to residents so that they know they can easily go to those sites uh, and get vaccinated. Uh, I do think uh, the issue still needs to be one of us improving access while we focus on uh, hesitancy, but we need to we need to make it very easy for people to get vaccinated. We obviously are working closely with the archdiocese, uh, who in fact support uh, people getting vaccinated with any vaccine uh, that's available. Uh, they've issued statements. They've talked about it. Uh, from their pulpits, and in some cases, we're partnering with them to set up uh, restricted clinics for their parishioners, again, in our hard-hit communities, um, as we are doing with lots of our uh, houses of worship and our partnerships with the faith-based community. I, I think those partnerships remain key. I think working with our trusted providers, making sure we're registering uh, those that are not vaccinators yet to be vaccinators, is gonna to continue to be the strategy so that we make more and more progress on getting uh, doses into the arms of everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, next I have a Supervisor Mitchell, Hahn, and Sheila Kuehl. In that order? Madam Chair, uh, you uh, posed the question um, that I was gonna ask, so thank you so much, I'll pass. Thank you, okay, Supervisor Hahn? Yes, I thought I was after Holly. She she deferred. Oh, okay. Um, thanks uh, to both of you, Dr. Frere and Galley, for for this uh, uh, regular update on this. It does really feel I, I really sense your positivity, uh, Dr. Frere. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And I I, I love it's real. that. Yeah, because you know this, we really are seeing the light at the end of this tunnel, and it keeps getting brighter. I, you know, we're making good progress on on vac vaccinating folks. Our test positivity rate is at an all time low. More of our businesses are going to be opening their doors again. Um, I was going to um, focus a little bit on this uh, last phase of our vaccine campaign, even though we still, I know, are pushing for our underserved communities, and that's the 16 and older. Um, do you, what, what do you think your strategy is for reaching the 16 year and older? Are we, are you thinking about doing mobile clinics at schools for students um, while they're still on campus? Uh, between now and June, or what? What's your what? What do you think is the best way to go about reaching 16-year-olds? Yeah, I mean, um, so yes, we are working uh, with all of our school districts because remember, every school district has a partner uh, that help make sure they could vaccinate their staff um, and their uh, teachers. Um, so we are working to see which of those partners have some bandwidth to come back now and start vaccinating uh, students. Um, and in some places, obviously, that's easier than in others. Uh, yeah, and are there, are there partners uh, able to set up these mobile clinics to actually come onto the campuses? Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, many of the partners were doing that. And we'll also have, you know, obviously our mobile teams out as mm -hmm. well. I know that LAUSD has a plan to open up 25 sites across, you know, their, wide, their big district. Uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks. I think three are open now, but they're expanding every week over the next couple of weeks. And they too will be vaccinating, not just students 16 and 17 and 18, but also family members, which again, a great strategy, and uh, our ability to use our mm -hmm. schools. So yes, you know, we're open to that, um, obviously. And, and particularly, again, in the communities that have been the hardest hit, uh, where kids are now back at schools and back in the school buildings, it makes a right. lot of sense yeah. to build those partnerships again. I'm, I'm old enough to remember, uh, you know, when uh, I, I got my polio uh, vaccination on a sugar cube oh. at my elementary yeah. school. And there was just something about on school, on the campus, everybody yeah. was doing it. It just didn't seem weird or strange that you were ingesting the sugar cube. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, I agree. I, I too remember that. And um, yeah. again, we've always noted that that schools uh, were going to be important places, particularly uh, once students were going to start being eligible to get vaccinated. Right. So let me uh, switch back to uh, businesses. And again, your team obviously has been super busy. 
uh, keeping up, keeping up with all the reopenings allowed by the state. Um, I see that uh, currently we have 15 updated health protocols for different activities. Um, how are you doing? What are you doing? Um, is, is it a bit overwhelming to educate businesses and residents on these latest <laughs> new protocols? Yeah, I mean, many of them, um, you know, are, are relatively simple changes. Uh, uh, you know, there are a few places, for example, we updated uh, houses of worship to again mm -hmm. align with the new change because of a court decision. Uh, we've updated, obviously, the rules for informal gatherings, which are the most complicated because we have differences between people who are vaccinated and people who are not vaccinated. Um, at restaurants, uh, bars, breweries, uh, distilleries, and wineries, you know, we're relaxing some of the restrictions, uh, so everybody is is welcoming that information. And mm -hmm. again, we sent we have these, as as my staff told me, there are now over eight hundred thousand businesses um, that are getting right. emails from us. Right, that's what I'm saying. The, yeah, it seems yes. it's a bit overwhelming, but yeah. I know it's welcome. I know we're working with our chambers of commerces in our districts to make sure that they can disseminate. Uh, these new protocols to to their businesses. So oh, thank you so uh, much. We we appreciate any help from the board offices or suggestions. Yeah, we yeah. also work a lot with. The yeah, because I mean, I th they want to know. They're ready, but they certainly want to know the protocols. Um, yeah. Let me. The la my last question, Madam Chair, is uh, back to uh, vaccinations, uh, Dr. Farr. Um, you've mapped out that between now and the end of June, we can have eighty percent of our residents vaccinated. Um, if all that goes in the right direction, what date are you looking to maybe close these mega pods and, you know, oh, work, to, work to push, you know, the allocations more to pharmacies, doctor's offices, that, or, or is that even something you're, you're looking at? Well, you know, it's such a great question. I mean, we obviously uh, are prepared to keep the vaccination sites open uh, longer than the end of June, because um, one thing that could happen is in the summer, we could be able to start vaccinating children 12 to 15. Okay. Um, and many of them, many of them may be out of school. So, so, okay. um, so you're, you're, uh, so you're, yeah, you're planning on keeping these and maybe, and um, have, have we even thought about the, the booster shots too? Um, yeah. I'm hearing all sorts of things about six months later nine months later and maybe we're going to use our megapods for that too but it would be nice i do think i, I really am looking forward to uh you know getting out to our, our more doctor's offices and pharmacies and uh you know kind of the way you used to get your flu shot yeah and we're i mean obviously we've been working all along that's why we have we have the largest number of providers in the state that are in a network because we just keep registering right. everybody we can, including private uh, practice providers. Um, we want them registered. We want them, you know, this is a vaccine that does require special registration, uh, but we want them in that system because we agree with you 100%. Uh, right. No matter what happens with the large capacity sites, much of uh, the vaccination uh, work really should be happening within the healthcare system just like it does for flu vaccine right. uh, and, and many other vaccinations. And to be honest, uh, we have a very good system for pediatric vaccinations and, uh, and that does rely you know, almost exclusively on primary care providers and pediatricians. Right. Uh, the issue with, with us was we don't have such a great system for adult immunizations and that's why the megapods became so important as well as all of these other sites. Right. Uh, but our goal is to continue to to have a massive network that really makes it very easy for people to go to their primary care provider or their specialty pro right. care provider uh, to get that vaccine. Uh, sometime in the summer, if we're still, you know, we still have a lot of people that, that need to get vaccinated. And certainly as we look towards either boosters or an additional vaccine dose that we're right. needed in the future. Well, clearly the clearly vaccinations have been the game changer. I mean, that, that we have just seen that. It's been amazing. And I will say, you know, to the megapods, uh, bravo, because, I mean, I don't hear, it's hard to track people's experiences 
when they're not at the megapods, but everybody I know that's that's gone to the megapods has just really had a good experience. And uh, when you think about the logistics involved in each one of those, it's pretty incredible uh, that they got up and running, that they happened, that volunteers were recruited, that your staff still was working them, and people really had positive experiences. So. Bravo, but um, I, I do look forward to when we can push these out more into people's neighborhoods. Anyway, th thank you, Madam Chair. I yield thank you. time. Great, thank you. Next, we'll uh, she Sheila Kuehl, Supervisor Kuehl. Now, thank you, Madam Chair. My questions were answered, so I'll pass. Ah, okay. Any other further questions from any other members? Supervisor Barger, did I miss you? No, no I'm good, thank okay. you. Okay, great. So that, I, I mean, that, I think this says a whole lot about the work that our two uh, directors have done. Uh, again, just want to reiterate and thank Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Galley and your teams, Dr. Davis, everyone, Dr. Simon, everyone has just been so outstanding and all the, the partners and volunteers in our, in our uh, county workforce too that, is, that have helped us get to this point. So there is a lot to be uh, proud of. So thank you very much uh, for your reports today. And again, we look forward uh, to hearing more news later if we do move into uh, the next tier. So um, at this point, if there's no other comments under, under this item, S1, the report is a receive and filed. Hearing no objections, that will be the order. Okay, members. Now we want to uh, return back to item number one. And this is with respect to the hearing on annexation and le leveling of assessments for county lighting districts, again, in unincorporated areas of Azusa was Whittier, Los Nietos, East La Mirada, Roland Heights, and Canola Mesa. Uh, Madam Executive Officer, please report on the ballot tabulation results. Madam Chair and members of the board, after tabulating the ballots, a determination has been made that no majority protest exists against the pro pros annexation levy of assessment for petition numbers 3-117. 2-1016, 117-1118, and 19-517. In the unincorporated areas of Azusa, West Whittier, Los Nietos, East Los La Mirada, Roland Heights, and Canonola Mesa proposed for annexation to County Lighting Maintenance District 1687 and County Lighting District Landscape and Lighting Act 1 unincorporated zone in the formation of improvement zone 559 for petition number 3-117. As a result, it would be appropriate for the board to adopt the resolution, ordering the annexation and levy of assessment, approve of a loan for the formation of improvement zone 559 for petition number 3-117 and the joint resolutions accepting the negotiated exchange of property tax revenue resulting from the annexation of petition territories. Okay, very good. Item one is before us. I will move that, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item one is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries, five to zero. Thank you. Members, now we will move on to item number eight, returning Bruce's Beach to its rightful owners and item nine, Los Angeles County sponsor, Senate Bill 796, Bradford, which were held by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn, please begin your remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, colleagues, it was around this time last year that I, Unfortunately, he first heard the story of Willa and Charles Bruce. Um, it's embarrassing to me that I grew up in Los Angeles County and did not know this story. Uh, I actually grew up learning to swim uh, in the ocean in Manhattan Beach, a few blocks from uh, Bruce's Beach. This is a story of the American dream being stolen from a hardworking African-American family just because of their race. And it happened right here in LA County. In 1912, Willa and Charles Bruce purchased two parcels of property on the Strand in Manhattan Beach, which was one of the only places at that time that allowed African-Americans to purchase beachfront land. 
Willa went on to build a resort that became known as Bruce's Beach and black families traveled from far and wide to be able to enjoy the simple pleasure of a day at the beach that segregationist policies across the state too often kept from them. Our very own fire chief, Chief Osby, has shared the story of his own family's connection to the resort. His grandmother used to travel for five hours with her family from San Diego to come to Bruce's Beach because it was the closest beach to them that welcomed black beachgoers. But white neighborhood neighbors in the area resented the black beachgoers, constantly harassing the patrons of Bruce's Beach in an attempt to drive them out. Um, despite these racist scare tactics, Bruce's Beach remained a popular destination and the business was thriving. So when that didn't work, the city of Manhattan Beach took matters into their own hands and declared eminent domain to take the Bruce's family property in 1924, claiming the need to build a public park. The Bruce's fought in court to keep the property, but in 1929, the city seized it anyway. And Willa and Charles Bruce were paid a fraction of what they asked for and were denied the ability to buy beachfront property elsewhere. Bruce's Beach closed down and the Bruce family left Manhattan Beach, which was exactly what that city council had wanted. And then the land sat, sat empty for decades. It's well documented that this was an act motivated by racism, a lawful thriving business that provided African-Americans access to the beach was intentionally shut down by the Manhattan Beach government with the intention of driving out black families and black beachgoers. The Bruce's had their California dreams stolen from them. And this was an injustice inflicted, injustice inflicted not just on Willa and Charles Bruce, but on generations of their descendants, who most certainly would have been millionaires if they'd been able to keep this property and their successful business. And now we at the county have an opportunity to right this wrong. We can't change the past but we can do everything in our power in the present to correct this historic injustice. Through a series of land transfers, the land that was once owned by Charles and Willa Bruce now belongs to us, the County of Los Angeles. The LA, lifeguard, the LA County Lifeguards Administration Building sits directly on top of the property that used to be the Bruce's Resort. When I realized that the county now had ownership of the original property, I wanted to do what I could to start writing this wrong. I felt there was nothing else to do but to give the property back to the direct descendants of Willa and Charles Bruce. And we had one of them who called in today, Anthony Bruce. So today, colleagues, we have two motions before us that will get us on the path to start to return the property to the family. The first motion, which is item eight, will direct the county to come up with a plan and the next steps to return the land to its rightful owners, the descendants of Charles and Willa Bruce. This plan will include consulting with the fire department to discuss the future of the lifeguard building. Any decision about how to move forward will be made with their input. And I wanna thank Chief Osby for sending a letter of support to each of us this morning for this effort and for firefighter Johnny Gray who called this morning on behalf of the Stentorians of LA County, which is the local association of African Americans in the fire service. He waited on the queue for an hour and unfortunately he didn't get called to share his public comment, but he will be submitting those in writing. The second motion, item nine, directs the county to sponsor SB 796, which is the legislation that Senator Steve Bradford has introduced that will allow the county to return the land to the family. And the reason we need, to, we need this is because when the state who had gotten the property from Manhattan Beach, when they transferred it back to Los Angeles County in 1995, it came with some strings attached. It came with restrictions. Um, and as it stands right now, LA County can't change the ownership or the use of the land because of those state restrictions. Um, SB 796 will remove those restrictions on Bruce's Beach and will allow this board to vote to transfer the land back to the Bruce family. 
I really want to thank Steve Bradford, who stepped up immediately um, to author this legislation. And I want to thank Senator Ben Allen, Assemblymember Al Marsucci, and Assemblymember Autumn Burke for being the co-authors. We have the opportunity not only to right a wrong that happened right here in LA County, but also to be an example to the rest of the nation on how governments can begin to act now to correct historic injustices. I hope that other cities, other counties, other states will see what we're doing here and will be inspired to look at their own histories and identify opportunities to begin to repair and make amends. I'm asking for the support of each of you today, colleagues, as we embark on this effort. And I wanna thank our newest colleague, Supervisor Holly Mitchell, for being the co-author on both of these motions and for all of her support on this. Uh, we will need Supervisor Mitchell, Supervisor Kuehl, and uh, Solis, all of you served in Sacramento. I never did. And I know it gets complicated up there, uh, and I'll need all of you to help us, uh, you know, really lobby Sacramento so that this bill gets passed so we can again begin to right this historic wrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, Supervisor Mitchell, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And to Supervisor Hahn, I thank you um, so much for the invitation to participate in um, history making with you. Thank you very much um, on a deeply personal level. You know, it occurred to me as I stood with you and some of my fellow um, state legislative former colleagues um, on that incredible stretch of beach in Manhattan Beach that, you know, there are any number of people um, that don't know uh, local black history. And I think we all have to make it a point to make sure that we tell the true story of our late native Los Angeles and California history. And you know, to imagine that over a hundred years ago, a black man and woman would have the resources and the wherewithal and the vision to buy a piece of beachfront property and build on it and establish a business. And it occurred to me also, you know, how inappropriate it was for one group of people um, to think it appropriate to block another group of people from having access to something that none of us own, which is the ocean and her shores. I think it's important that, that we in government understand the fundamental use of our powers around eminent domain, how delicate that is and how in its use over many, many decades, you know, underrepresented groups of people, black and brown people's communities have been um, ravaged. Um, everything from the construction of the Santa Monica Freeway that, that divided and cut into um, major swaths of communities um, and impacted uh, individual home ownership, to Chavez Ravine and another community whose home ownership was impacted. You know, eminent domain is supposed to be reserved for the use of public good, uh, or when it's a nuisance property that needs to be, you know, brought up to code and again used for public code, public good. But housing covenants and zoning um, throughout Los Angeles history have been devices used by government and others to um, keep a community down, to have direct impact on limiting multi-generational wealth, limiting home ownership, and really challenging equity. And so to have the opportunity to honor people like Biddy Mason, who um, research suggests owned most of down, what we now know as downtown Los Angeles, the dozens of families who also bought parcels surrounding the Bruce parcel in Manhattan Beach, the, the great grandparents of a former colleague of mine, Ana Gonzalez, to have the opportunity to return to a family, a property that was taken from them based on racist ideology and discrimination um, is a great moment in Los Angeles history today. This is but one example of property lost 
of uh, Dreams Deferred. Uh, and we've got um, the unique opportunity to uh, set an example, as Supervisor Han said. And so I am proud to co-author and will be even more proud as a Native Angelino to cast my vote today on agenda items eight and nine to correct an historic wrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you much, Supervisor Mitchell. Um, Supervisor Kuehl, you're recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. You know, it's always been interesting to me the various ways in which one group of people finds to deny something to another group of people and the long, long, long historical ramifications for the Black community. It has often been the denial of the uh, accrual of any kind of wealth, wealth that can be passed on, wealth that can be used to improve life. And land ownership is a big part of that. Uh, certainly all the way back to what the settlers did to our indigenous peoples, and I think we're going to be hearing about that over the next several years as well, in terms of, I mean, they didn't even have a concept that you could own the land. Talk about something that couldn't be owned being the ocean. To the tribes, the entire earth was like that. It wasn't, it was something that we borrowed but didn't own. And I think about, uh, Holly, about our colleague, I'm not even sure you were in the legislature yet, but no Takasugi, whose family went to an internship camp and um, was, uh, you know, lost their property along with every other Japanese family uh, in our state that was taken away and locked up. And how the denial of ownership is such a powerful thing. So thanks to you, Supervisor Han and Mitchell, for starting here and saying, you know, we've, we've got to do our best where we can to reverse this. Uh, several of my constituents called on me to support this uh, in comment this morning, and I wanted to jump in and go, yeah, how could I not? Um, so I'm happy to join in the affirmative vote for these two motions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. I, I also want to uh, commend both uh, authors, uh, Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Mitchell, and obviously uh, Senate Bill 796 by Senator Bradford. Um, this strikes at the core, I think, of, of our belief in, in, in our system of government and how uh, in many ways um, historically has been unfair in terms of treating different groups as outlined by all of you. Um, as a Latina, I know how important this issue is and know that our community, Latinos, have also been faced with many tragic uh, occurrences throughout our history. Uh, the Bracero program that uh, actually brought people up here to work and then took them and moved them, removed them, even if some of them were born here and sent back to Mexico and were never given reparations. Um, the Chavez Ravine that split our communities up, the 10 freeway, the five, uh, all of these freeways that went right through the heart of our communities and, and even the uh, forced sterilization of women at our uh, county hospital years ago. All these things are part of our history. We can't remove them, but we can shine a light on them and make sure that they never come back. And this is certainly a way to do it and to pay homage to this family, uh, the Bruce's family that deserves so much more. So thank you both uh, for that. Supervisor Hahn, do you want to close? Uh, thank you. I just really appreciate uh, uh, what everyone is saying. Uh, and uh, one of the things that Supervisor Mitchell said at the press conference last week, she, she said, just to be clear, uh, we're not gifting uh, anything here. We are returning stolen property. And I thought that was the perfect framing of this issue. And uh, when I've been asked, are you afraid that it will start a precedent. I said, I hope it does. So to listen to each one of you this morning and understanding how passionate each of you are about justice and what that means, I couldn't be uh, more pleased to serve uh, with you today. And I uh, am excited about this vote. Thank you. If there are no other supervisors that would like to make any remarks, then uh, 
The item eight is before us. We're gonna take a vote on that first. So this is moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item eight is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Great. Item number nine is also before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item nine is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Great. Thank you, members. Congratulations to both of you. Uh, we will now move on to item number 10, the zero emission infrastructure plan, which was held by Supervisor Hahn. Uh, Supervisor Hahn, you are on. Okay, I was so excited about that last vote. What <laughs> item are we on? We're on your item 10. Oh, oh right. You mean there's other things on the agenda today? Oh, my goodness. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this is about uh, a zero emissions infrastructure plan, and uh, I'm happy to have uh, Supervisor Kuehl uh, as my uh, co-author on this. You know, for the past de decade, uh, I think we've seen slower progress than we've wanted in our nation's transition to electric vehicles. And the issue with electric vehicles and their chargers has always been sort of a chicken and egg problem. What comes first, the vehicles or the charging stations? But now as a state and a nation, we're starting to take major steps toward promoting both. And last fall, our governor issued an executive order requiring all new cars sold to be zero emissions by 2035. And President Biden has also expressed his commitment to this transition. He, his American Jobs Plan has enough funding to install at least 500,000 EV charging stations across the United States by 2030. And right here in our own backyard, I'm so proud of our ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, and they've committed to transitioning terminal equipment to zero emissions by 2030 and the on-road trucks by 2035. Um, and in today's agenda, we're going to be voting to approve a zero emission vehicle fleet policy for LA County that will require us to purchase zero emission vehicles wherever and whenever available that will meet our operational needs. And we are making progress, but we need to go further. We need to push harder as a county to get more electric vehicles on the road. And to do that, we're gonna need to install as many charging stations as possible in as many parts of the county as possible. Um, it's no surprise that right now, EV charging stations are predominantly located in our higher income communities. But if we wanna make electric vehicles accessible to everyone, we're going to need more charging stations in our underserved and lower income neighborhoods too. And our uh, lower income and underserved communities, particularly I know around the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, have experienced more uh, health related challenges as a result of emissions uh, coming from vehicles. Uh, we also need them to be uh, at our destinations like our county beaches, our parks, our stadiums, our airports. The zero emission vehicle infrastructure plan that Supervisor Kuehl and I are introducing today is aiming to jumpstart, but no pun intended, this process by identifying exactly where we need more EV charging stations and provide opportunities to get those stations installed. I'm asking that as we develop this plan, we do so with an eye towards our most advanced charging technology and keep our focus on the medium to heavy vehicles, some of the biggest contributors to our local pollution. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I uh, would ask for your support. Supervisor Kuehl, who's your co-author, would like to be recognized. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Very briefly, thanks to uh, Supervisor Hahn for bringing this. I'm very happy and uh, proud to be co-authoring. It sets us up the kind of infrastructure we need to 
encourage uh, what is already a growing adoption of electric vehicles in the county, uh, help us get on track with the goals in our own sustainability plan, which is now being copied in more than 25 different uh, counties and cities across the country and probably more by today. Uh, we can get state and federal funds that are becoming available and that will help us put them to good use. Um, most importantly, it allows us to uh, ensure that the public charge infrastructure is distributed equitably across the communities and you know break down barriers to electric vehicle adoption you want to make it as easy as possible the prices are coming down on um, electric vehicles and I'd like to see them everywhere you know during the pandemic when people were not driving as much everyone was commenting on how clear the air was and you know oh my goodness the sky is actually blue well it can stay that way if we drive more and more electric vehicles. Uh, additionally, it creates workforce training opportunities, which is another equitable consideration for us to support the installation and maintenance of the infrastructure. Uh, it's a good example of how transition away from fossil fuels actually creates pathways to new jobs. So it's exciting. I'm happy to support it. I like being the co-author, and I ask for your I vote. Good. Uh, seeing no other members wanting to be recognized, uh, and I also support uh, this motion. Congratulations to both of you for your work on this, and I'm very excited about the opportunity to focus on disadvantaged communities, particularly along the 710 uh, corridor and what have you. But um, with that, then, hearing no other comments, item 10 is before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl. To approve this item, Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 10 is before you. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Motion carries 5 to 0. Great. Thank you. Uh, now we will move on to item 11, establishing the aging department which was held by Supervisor Hahn, and then we'll go on to item 22, establishing the Los Angeles County Economic and Work Workforce Development Department, which I held. So Supervisor Hahn, you can begin with item number 11. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, your item two goes hand in hand with this. Um, and you know, two years ago, just to remind everybody, we uh, looked to see how we might improve the lives of Los Angeles County's, County's older adults, which many of us are. Um, and we decided to explore the creation of a standalone county department dedicated solely to serving um, that community. Uh, we talked to leading experts in the field of gerontology, on, on policy, on what our needs were, um, and it turned out that it is not only an option to create a standalone department, but also that having this department is essential to help the estimated four million older adults that we have here in our county by 2030. Uh, additionally, it was suggested that another growing population that needs to have more attention paid to it is those uh, with disabilities, which will mirror the state's master plan on aging. This past year uh, has made the need for a department more urgent than ever. Um, so we can really make sure that we're addressing the issues that impact our older adults, such as housing stability, access to food quality, and critical services, health services, and so much more. Um, so a new strong and visible Department on Aging and Disabilities will reduce the fragmented services of our over 20 plus county agencies currently uh, providing to this group. So we have this group being serviced, but it's been, been serviced by too many departments. We need to get it into one department. So we're setting in motion today, colleagues, the Department of Aging, um, a new department that will allow us to plan for the future, deliver innovative programming, and continue to support the county's families uh, I know our CEO has worked closely with our workforce development, aging, community services, our departments of mental health, health services, public social services, human resources, and county council to create a three-year phased approach uh, that will uh, transition our current workforce development and aging community services, WEDACs, into two 
new standalone departments, the Department on Aging and Disabilities, and the Economic Workforce Development Department. I think this is the right thing for us to do um, right now. Um, and thank you, Chair Solis, for leading the effort uh, for the economic and workforce uh, issues uh, uh, department. I think uh, everything we're doing is trying to, again, be that county where it feels good to live, um, you're, you're safe uh, in, in terms of the, the, the security that we provide, the health services we provide, but also let's make LA County the best place uh, to grow old and uh, because we are gonna be providing those services. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, very much, Supervisor Hahn, for that. And I also want to thank Supervisor Kuehl for her partnership on, on the motion that I have uh, before us today, item 22. Um, but again, this is so important and critical to develop the Department of Aging as well as this new Economic and Workforce Development Department. You know, it's logical that we consider both motions at the same meeting as they are central to our efforts of restructuring WEDEX and other departments. The motion I've authored is an important step, I believe, on a long journey of creating a new department within the county that's focused on economic and workforce development. Given the past year regarding the economic and work workforce disruptions, I believe the timing is just right. At the beginning of my first term, we started on a path to create economic development strategies and program for the county. We also started to work on how to align our workforce programs, but now we're facing a long and and very uh, troubling economic and workforce recovery process. And as you may know, the latest state unemployment data for Los Angeles County for February 2021 shows an unemployment rate of 11.5%, more than doubled the pre-pandemic rate of 5% from the same month last year. And as you know, these impacts have been concentrated in low-income communities of color. While the county has taken steps to mitigate the impact, the pandemic has shown us the difficulty of crafting a coordinated response without a consolidated economic and workforce department. The new economic and workforce department would be charged with developing strategies to prepare our workforce using an equity lens and focusing on all underserved communities. It will be responsible for contingency plans and strategies designed to mitigate job and revenue losses caused by financial disruptions from unforeseeable recessions like the one we're currently experiencing. And the new department should also address the uneven playing field and disparities that the pandemic has revealed. Finally, I believe it will strengthen the county's focus on public-private partnerships, capacity building for new and small businesses and for workforce development initiatives. So I believe we need we have a standalone we need to have to ha we need to have a standalone department focus on our local economy developing and rebuilding our workforce. Not only do we need to focus on basic job training, employment, social services, housing, we also need to take a closer look at upskilling our workers, particularly people who are being impacted by technolo technological changes in the industry such as the automation and the gig economy. We also need to support and expand industries with good paying jobs with the intention to open doors for people who have historically been left out of economic opportunity and mobility. The county must develop a long-term roadmap and establish structure for our economic development programs. In my view, the economic and workforce development complement one another and should be considered together. Taken with Supervisor Hans' motion, motion today, we're reaching a critical milestone in launching not just one, but two new departments. The Department of Aging will help address the many challenges that older adults and adults with disabilities face, especially in light of the pandemic. Supervisor Hans' motion will help grow and strengthen communities throughout the county in order to improve the lives of older adults, no matter what place they call home. I look forward to receiving a comprehensive set of recommendations in the report back. And I thank my colleagues and respectfully request your I vote on both items. And I want to also recognize my co-author, Supervisor Fjord. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks to both of you for uh, taking each of the pieces of this department. I think it's possible that people listening um, or uh, uh, watching this later wonder why these motions are taken together. And 
the, the truth is, for many years, we have had these elements all as part of one department, um, where we have workforce development, we have some economic development, we certainly have elder and community services all in one department. And they've done a great job. I want to praise all of the leadership and staff in that department. The uh, um, separation into more focused departments is not a reflection uh, of the of any problem with that work, but rather the light that that work shown on what I think uh, is important in those departments to our constituents. Uh, you know, it's funny. Be uh, early in the county's history, it essentially concentrated on health, it uh, delivering health to those who could not afford it or get it, uh, health care for themselves. And then with the homelessness crisis growing and growing, we began to concentrate more and more on housing. And I began to think of the elements that actually make a life possible. And to me, it's kind of a three-legged stool, your health, your housing, and your work, because it, you have to be healthy to keep a job you have to have a job to keep your housing and you have to have housing to keep healthy. So we are now recognizing, I think, the importance of that third piece in uh, focusing a department on workforce and economic development. Uh, another arena where I thought we always had a sort of a, um, a lack was that although we appropriately have cared for children because they are not seen to be able to care for themselves, uh, we have essentially reflected the kind of American philosophy of every man for himself if, once you get to be a certain age. You're not our problem. You're really the problem of your family. Uh, you know, you, uh, and then when Medicare came in, things changed a little bit, recognizing with Social Security and Medicare that there were some needs that government should accrue and take care of. But this, I think, takes it a notch further, and I really thank Supervisor Hahn for uh, being so fierce about this and separating this out because uh, it's an aspect, I think, of concentration. Uh, concentration really has two major meanings. One is we are focused, we are concentrating on this community, on workforce development, so that that's what we do when we develop individual departments. But in this case, it's also a concentration of scattered services. Uh, in the workforce development, for instance, bringing together uh, services that are now all over the county in WEDAX, in uh, DCBA, in the uh, LACTA, in the CEO economic development area, and bringing it, I think, so that we can focus more. So I'm very happy to participate and support uh, these, I look forward to the phased-in approach. I think it's the best way to go so that we get it right as we go along. Uh, you know, we're the 19th largest economy in the world. That is, our county is. And uh, so uh, we play a critical role in ensuring that uh, many parts of our state and national economy continue to thrive. And this kind of focus, I think, will really help us to do what we should and continue to reimagine the way that we help all the constituents in our county. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good, seeing uh, that no other members wanna make any remarks, uh, we're going to take up these two items separately. So we are taking up item 11, which is before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by myself to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 11 is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Item 22 is before us. I will move, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl, to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 22 is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. 
Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries, five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, now we will move on to item number 15, proclaiming May 2021, the most important ever Mental Health Awareness Month, which was held by Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Barger, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also want to thank Supervisor Kuehl for co-authoring today's motion with me. Recognizing Mental Health Awareness Month has been a critical effort of this county for many years. The Department of Mental Health has taken it to a new level in recent years with the annual We Rise campaign to erase the stigma. Two weeks ago, our board heard from Dr. Sharon on the mental health impact and considerations during the last year of the pandemic. And I think we can all agree this really is the most important ever Mental Health Awareness Month. It's my hope that this crisis will be an opportunity for all of us to engage with our communities on the importance of talking about mental illness and making mental health services more accessible. I am grateful for the work the We Rise campaign has done in this effort over the past, past few years and want to recognize the department's work in adjusting to the new circumstances of pushing this message this year. I also want to thank the private partners that have come alongside this effort as sponsors of the ReRise campaign. As we have said, this is an all hands on deck effort and we need each and every partner to come alongside the county's work to end the stigma. So with that, again, thank you, Supervisor Kuehl for co-authoring this motion with me and I hope I can get your support. Supervisor Kuehl, you're recognized. Very much. I want to deeply thank Supervisor Barger for doing this. It's, uh, you know, normally we just say uh, this is something month or we're celebrating this week. And I like the idea of making this more substantive because the uh, the We Rise exhibit was critical, really, in so many ways. Uh, I walked through it three different times uh, when we could still go places. Uh, and it was amazing to me how healing it was to those who were there, who were going through, who uh, we had uh, conversations afterward about the impact that it had. Um, and I think it would be really good if there was any way to collect some of those stories. Um, and, and it's such a good idea to have these out in the various communities. So um, this is great. I'm happy to co-author. Uh, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Barger for asking me, and I also ask for your I vote. Very good. Uh, are there any other comments from members? Seeing none, this item 15 is before us. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Kuehl to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 15 is before you. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, members. Now we will move on to item 21, creation of a Care First Jail's last capital project fund, which was held by Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Mitchell, please uh, begin your statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chair uh, and Supervisor Kuehl for your leadership in realizing the Care First Jail Last vision for our county. Uh, I'd also like to thank the MCJ Closure Work Group for their hard work in developing a roadmap for achieving one of the county's most important justice reforms. This board has appropriately, in my opinion, recognized the need to take a thoughtful approach towards the complex work of closing a jail facility and developing rehabilitative alternatives. And so it's clear to me and, and many others in our community that now is the time for direct action. The time has come for us to finally close MCJ and realize the bold and historic and visionary care first vision developed by the county in conjunction with community partners and stakeholders. Every day that we allow MCJ to stay open, we fail to meet our basic obligations to the people who live and work there. And we've known for over a year since uh, the RAND researchers confirmed their findings from a uh, confirmed earlier findings from a county study 
that 61% of the jail mental health population are appropriate candidates for diversion. That was one study among many that I've just reviewed since joining the Board of Supervisors that have focused on this collective work around care first, jail last. So we've got to take big steps, even in the short term, to decrease the jail population by expanding diversion programs and implementing other recommendations of the MCJ closure and the ATI work groups. So to do that, uh, I've got three points, three areas that I would love to have addressed uh, in conjunction with the motion brought by um, Solis and Kuehl today. First of all, we've got to avoid delays as much as possible. Many of the recommendations in the ATI and the MSA, MCJ closure reports can be implemented without any further study from a consultant or uh, even incurring uh, expenses incurred by an outside consultant. As I just mentioned before, there have been numerous studies, RAN, studies done by ODR and other internal and external stakeholders to study the effect of this decision. It's also critical that these capital project funds not be used to build new jail facilities. I know that's the commitment this board has made and that new modifications or renovations are only for improving conditions. As we take first steps towards closing MSA, MCJ, we have an opportunity to ensure greater equity in even the hiring of disadvantaged workers, including formerly incarcerated individuals for whom it is extremely difficult to find opportunities for gainful employment that ensure their successful reentry and reduced recidivism. A clear inspiration for this kind of work is the work done by uh, Madam Chair uh, in East LA, uh, Supervisor Solis has established a health innovation community partnership as a community engagement vehicle for all local community organizations and county departments. Partners in this uh, project work collaboratively in envisioning all development at the county-owned LAC USC Medical Center to ensure the local community benefits. To date, all development at LAC USC Medical Campus has exceeded the aspirational 50% local higher standard requested by Supervisor Solis. That's an amazing model that we can replicate in other areas of the county. So with that explanation about the three points I wanted to make, um, I'd like to, that I think address additional critical areas um, that this motion attempts to address, I'd like to read in the following amendments. For Directive 4C, that we add the following after the first sentence, quote, where any funding is spent for modifications or renovations, those modifications or renovations should be without expansion unless specifically ordered by a court. For Directive 4D, I'd like to strike the word consultant and add a fifth directive that says, quote, the funds allocated through this appropriation adjustment shall not be used for any consultant services without prior board approval. And lastly, to add a sixth directive that says, quote, instruct the CEO to report back and write it in 60 days on how the Care First Jail's last capital project and any other projects related to the closure of Men's Central Jail will be subject to LA County's Community Workforce Agreement. This report back should also include options for the county to set a higher targeted and local worker hire goal for disadvantaged workers with a special effort directed at recruiting formerly incarcerated residents and consider examples of county projects where the targeted and local hire percentages achieved were substantially higher than the 30% and 10% standard respectively, including exploring best practices established by the Health Innovation Community Partnership around the LAC USC Medical Center. Thank you, Madam Chair, for consideration of my amendment. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. You know, at first glance, when I saw your amendments coming forward uh, yesterday, I wasn't clear where, where you were headed, but obviously through consultation with uh, other colleagues, Supervisor Kuehl, with my office and your office, as well as with other stakeholders, I know that we've come up with a good 
compromise. And in no way do I see us moving in uh, separate directions at all, because we have always been clear that one of the things that we need to make sure to the public is that there is closure of Men's Central Jail. So I'm happy to receive uh, that, uh, that amendment. And then secondly, I think with local hire and all of the PLAs and what have you, those are all important elements of every project that we've been considering, uh, I think, for the last few years. In fact, there's 50 projects or more that have had those elements contained. So it's something that the county has really embraced. I think prior to your coming here, uh, Supervisor and Mar uh, Mark Ridley Thomas and Sheila Kuehl, myself and others, Supervisor Hahn, all of us, and Supervisor Barger have all understood how instrumental it is to do the local hire and particularly show that these programs could be successful. And then I would say, uh, lastly, thank you for complimenting us on our uh, restorative care village at LAC USC because we really made an effort to uh, involve our community. In fact, more than 50 organizations make up uh, our uh, innovative group that informs us so that information that we're getting and receiving is how we move forward is exactly that, what the community wants. So I think those are really invaluable steps to take and I'm happy to accept uh, these friendly amendments and would ask uh, for support on uh, the motion as amended as we move forward on the Care First uh, uh, Jail Last uh, Project. So Supervisor, uh, Kuehl, I would now recognize you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you for inviting me to co-author the original motion and uh, uh, welcome the amendment as well, but also to uh, really praise you for uh, what has not been underscored as much, which is the uh, sort of the underlying purpose of the motion, which is um, that the, the, you know, the closure of MCJ, which we are committed to do depends heavily on the existence of community-based system of care, uh, which kind of really requires an all hands on deck effort. So um, it's, uh, this is a very important first step by pooling all the scattered resources that have been set aside for other originally jail related expenses into one Care First Jail's last capital fund specifically designated to support the closure of Men's Central. Um, this is a really important move, um, and uh, but I agree uh, with Supervisor Mitchell. We're unified in wanting to clarify there would be no expansion in other jail beds, and also you know supporting communities through the community worker agreements very important. Um, and uh, the call for a report back on the hiring, especially of formerly incarcerated individuals, it just seems like poetic justice, as they say, speaking of justice. So um, thank you, Supervisor Solis, for the original motion and letting me co-author it. And uh, thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for what you have added. And I also encourage and I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, are there any other members that wish to be recognized? Okay, seeing none, then uh, what I'd like to do is move this item as amended before us, uh, moved by myself and seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 21 as amended is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Abstain. Supervisor Barger, abstain. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries. Forward to zero with one abstention. Thank you. Okay, now members will move on to item 25, the mental health support for students as they return for in-person learning. I held that item. And I want to thank Supervisor Barger for co-authoring this motion along with me. And I'm mindful that we have much work to do in our vaccination efforts to fully contain the pandemic. But I want to ensure that we are being proactive about the county's recovery in the, in the months to come. No efforts to rebuild would truly be equitable or complete without considering our children and young adults, one of the populations that this pandemic has hurt the most. Although they have fortunately been less susceptible to serious outcomes from disease itself. The pandemic 
social isolation and accompanying school shutdowns has had a distinct impact on youth mental health. Even before COVID-19, one in five children had a diagnosed mental health disorder. And with the pandemic, these behavioral challenges have only increased and intensified. For many of our students, our schools were the first in line of mental health support. And with them out of the classroom, our youth went without necessary supports that they needed and relied on. A recent study by CDC showed that mental health visits related to children and youth increased by up to 31% just this last year. As our students come back to the classroom, I believe it's important that we are prepared to meet them with the mental health care and resources that they need. That's why we're introducing this motion instructing the Department of Mental Health in collaboration with the Los Angeles County Office of Education to put together a comprehensive plan and resources to support our students as they return to the classroom. This motion provides mechaniz mechanisms that will be in place to get support to our students, linking them to mental health resources. Teachers and parents will be offered training to identify early signs of mental health distress in their children, and mental health toolkits will be developed to support schools with trauma responsive training and resources. And after a year of defined by so much loss, trauma, and anxiety and uncertainty, we owe it to our children to make sure that they have the help that they need as we begin to put this pandemic behind us. I want to especially thank the Department of Mental Health and the Los Angeles County Office of Education and all the stakeholders who I know will put together a plan that really does serve our youth and puts them first. Now I'd like to turn to my co-author, Supervisor Barger, for any statement she would like to make. Thank you, Supervisor Solis, and I appreciate you uh, allowing me to be your co-author on this motion. As has been discussed, the mental health impact in, uh, on our youth this past year has been significant. I've heard from many school districts that have reached out to our office seeking support, both financial and resources, um, to help children coming back to school. Um, it's important for us to recognize that prior to COVID, there was already a need to enhance our mental health services within our school systems. And I know that out in the Antelope Valley in particular, they have been focused on that. According to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, only 50% of youth receive treatment for their mental illness in a given year. It is my hope that we can use the current return to the classroom as an opportunity to utilize new approaches in engaging our youth and providing them the services they critically need. I look forward to working with the Department of Mental Health and our community partners to advance this effort. And again, thank you for allowing me to be a co-author. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome. Uh, seeing no other members wanting to be recognized on this item, uh, item 25 is before us. I will move, seconded by Supervisor Barker, to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, Hold on a minute. Madam Executive Officer, we'll call the roll on item 25. Item 25 is before you. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kiel. Aye. Supervisor Kiel, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Next members will move on to item number 30, leveraging the county's position as a market participant to promote equity in county contracting, which was held by Supervisor Mitchell. And we will also hear from Supervisor Kuehl, the co-author. So, Supervisor Mitchell, you are on. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, the county as a market participant must take an active role in facilitating an accessible and inclusive economy for all of our residents, including when it comes to doing business with the county. Equitable contracting as a policy practice and institutional culture facilitates inclusive community economic growth, group growth helps businesses owned by people of color to thrive and grow, and attracts talented new businesses to become quality county partners. In fact, the City Foundation cites three primary benefits of diversifying contractors and opening the procurement process. First, diversification produces a broad community impact that's both common sense and quantifiable. Spreading government spending to contractors from various communities yields stronger communities, contributes to the overall growth of the middle class, and by proxy creates a more robust 
taxpayer base. Second, inequality has a direct impact on business growth. Inclusion in contracting provides stable revenue and helps firms to gain the experience necessary to grow. Public contracting all, often supports the growth of businesses that not otherwise have received an opportunity. These businesses have also shown to be more likely to hire staff of color from underserved communities. And the growth of businesses owned by people of color helps to address the wealth gap through both business and workforce development. And third and finally, by creating a barrier-free, well-defined and transparent procurement process, government benefits through increased competition and higher quality contractors. So I'd like to thank the work of Philanthropy and the Nonprofit Sector Work Group of the Economic Resiliency Task Force, led by Regina Birdsell, for providing meaningful feedback to the county on improving its contracting process. I know that many of our direct service organizations in this sector have served and continue to serve our most vulnerable residents who've been impacted by COVID-19, and that the scale of the need is outpacing the capacity of the sector to respond. So we've got to continue to engage our stakeholders and end users as equal partners in designing more transparent and inclusive contracting processes with the county. So with this motion, we'll be creating technical assistance and capacity building programs for our micro entrepreneurs, as well as our community-based organizations and nonprofit partners. Additionally, we will have the opportunity to explore the creation of smaller dollar value contracts so smaller organizations can actually access county business opportunities and will evaluate the burdensome procurement cycle by instituting methods of prompter payment and less onerous legal requirements. Uh, as a former nonprofit um, leader, it was always such a challenge when we had contracts with government entities where we were expected to deliver the service and do the work and wait 30, 60, 90, 120 days for our reimbursement from the governmental entity. So we can't expect small businesses to thrive and survive if government is delayed in paying them for work that they've already accomplished. So along with the work underway to streamline the contracting process through technology solutions, we will ensure that more of our county businesses and nonprofits, particularly those owned by women and people of color, will be able to do business with the County of Los Angeles. The county must proactively promote an anti-racist, diverse, equitable, and inclusive procurement process as one strategy to achieve economic opportunity for all of our communities. An accessible county public contracting process will be a pillar of our local economic recovery. Madam Chair, thank you very much for your consideration. I'm proud that the LA Area Chamber of Commerce has written in support, uh, as well as many other small and micro businesses across the county. Thank you very much. Supervisor Kuehl, you're recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think I get the uh, co-author of the week badge. I hope so anyway. Um, thank you to Supervisor Mitchell for allowing me to join you. Um, we've been working on this uh, for, you know, for quite a while, not this in particular, but streamlining and simplifying the contracting requirements in the county because it's just not easy. Um, and although we are talking about small businesses, in many, many, many cases, we're talking about small nonprofit businesses through whom we deliver our services uh, and, and all of the different things that are really required of us. Um, and now we don't really want it to be challenging. It's just that we understand that we're accountable to our taxpayers to ensure that every dollar is spent properly and efficiently. So what this motion does is to allow us to really do both. That is, we can accomplish that object objective and also provide equitable access to our small businesses and our community-based organizations. And, you know, COVIDs have a devastating impact on it. So this is a really, really good time to look at this. Um, we also are getting some funds to help support some of our small businesses and community-based organizations, but we have to think long-term. And so it's really been the inability to front fund uh, on the part of the organizations. And then, as Holly said, wait and wait and wait and wait for reimbursement by county contracts. And they, they just can't do it. So we have to consider providing 
interest-free loans to the CBOs. And it's not exactly an interest-free loan. It's really money we're going to give them anyway, but we're not going to make them front it and try to pay them more timely, more expeditiously. And as you said, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, also looking at legal requirements. I love legal requirements. I'm a lawyer. They're necessary, but they don't have to be so onerous for, you know, a $2 contract. I mean, let us be a little more simplified um, in all of the contracts and especially in the smaller ones. So thank you for uh, letting me co-author and I ask for everybody's I vote. Supervisor Kuhl, seeing no one else seeks recognition, uh, this item is before us. Uh, this is moved by Supervisor Mitchell, seconded by Supervisor Kuhl. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 30 is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 32, implementing the California Supreme Court's Humphrey decision, which was held by Supervisor Kuhl. Supervisor Kuhl, you're on. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. This is the uh, uh, one motion that I have uh, brought as the lead author. And I simply want to say three words that are going to mean a lot to a lot of people this very moment. Guilty, guilty, guilty. You may have heard uh, that it relates to a different case, and there's probably a lot of media going on about it at the moment. So I will return to my motion because part of the problem is that half of the people in our county jail have not even had their trial yet. They have not been declared guilty. They are simply there because they can't afford bail. And last month, the state Supreme Court ruled, thankfully, that it's unconstitutional to detain a person before their trial simply because they can't afford bail. And, you know, they're not people who pose a risk to public safety just because they can't afford to post bail because if I've got money to get out, it doesn't mean that I'm not a risk. Um, and the problem is keeping a person in jail because they don't have any money destabilizes already unstable lives. Uh, think about it. You lose your job. Uh, you have, might have custody of children. They've taken you to jail. You're there. You can't take care of your children. Your children get removed. So you could lose your children and even, of course, a spouse. Um, in jurisdictions all across the country, bail reform, when it's been implemented, has been shown to affect crime rates, but they go down, not up, or at the very least, are unaffected. So this motion, and I thank Supervisor Solis for co-authoring, directs the public defender and the alternate public defender and the DA to coordinate with the CEO, with county council, with the LA city attorney and the city attorney's association, with our probation department, with our sheriff, with our court, with California AG, and with those who are experts on pretrial disposition to develop recommendations in 60 days on how we can implement bail reform in compliance with our own state Supreme Court ruling. I am very, very excited about this because it's been a long time coming. Um, the courts have been uh, conducting a pilot project already uh, in LA County. I think that we'll be able to act very quickly in doing the right thing. It certainly represents a major step toward approving care first, jail last, and I would be grateful for your support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuhl, for allowing me to serve as your co-author on this item. Um, you know, it's still upsetting for me to think that the county is known to have the largest jail system in the country. The population in the LA County jails, as you know, are 80% Latinx and black people, which is sadly not surprising, but that has to change. Uh, of almost the 15,000 people in the jails, about 40% of them are pretrial. And we've heard from many, many of our impacted communities, 
and their families and advocacy groups about how detrimental it is to be in jail simply because they can't afford their bail amounts. Pre-trial pre incarceration doesn't just affect people in the short term, but it also has long-term consequences like increasing someone's inability to get a job, housing, and provide for their families as we heard from uh, callers this morning. It also increases someone's involvement in the criminal justice system, which is the opposite of care first. The recent ruling in the California Supreme Court on the Humphreys case makes it very clear that incarcerating someone pre-trial because of their inability to pay their bail amount is unconstitutional. This is not only a win for those who have been impacted by being incarcerated because of their inability to pay or being poor, but this is a win for public safety as well and that we are steering away from criminalizing people for being poor, houseless, or mentally ill. I'm so pleased that this is before us, and I also ask for your I vote. Thank you, Supervisor Fuel. Are there any members wishing to be recognized? Okay. Seeing none, item 32 is before us. Supervisor Kuehl moves. I second to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 32 is before you. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries, five and zero. We will now move on to item 43C, reevaluation of the 47 board approved homeless strategies, which was held by Supervisors Barger and Kuehl. Supervisor Barger, please unmute your mic and make your remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. The 47 homeless strategies designed by the CEO um, were and, and actually the um, uh, homeless initiative were developed back in 2015. While we have seen some progress in housing people experiencing homelessness, there has still been a rise in overall cases. This is supported by the point in time homeless counts that LASA has administered annually. LASA 2020 homeless count showed 66,436 people experiencing homelessness. This indicated a 12.7% rise from 58,936 in 2019. The next count will likely show more due to factors like COVID-19. Mm -hmm. The status quo is not working. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year and we are still failing and in some cases falling behind. The strategies were developed six years ago. Strategies need to be modified to continue to become to be effective. For example, in the last six years, the conversation on the role of mental illness and substance abuse have changed dramatically. Six years ago, many estimated that only 30% of people experiencing homelessness suffered from mental illness. Now, some studies project nearly 80% of people experiencing homelessness suffer from mental illness or substance abuse. This is a growing and ever-changing problem, and we must continue adapting. We are about halfway through the life, lifetime of Measure H. Now would be a good time to reevaluate and examine the efficiency and effectiveness of the 47 strategies. By bringing in outside groups like the Council of Governments and service providers to work with county departments, we seek a collaborative approach on recommendations for improving and modifying the existing strategies to combat the ever-changing homeless crisis. Um, so I would ask for a yes vote on today's motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. This item was also held by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Kuehl, and then I'll recognize the co-author, Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so far today, it's been a, a very uh, collaborative and positive day, and I hope that I may be forgiven if I um, put in a somewhat negative note as I don't support this motion. Um, and I'd like to say why and what my concern is um, and see if there's any possibility of, uh, I don't know, some kind of small change. Um, you know, the, the, the 47 homeless strategies took a very long time and a very lot of people to put together. It wasn't just the CEO. Uh, there were, you know, hundreds or, of people who participated over time to come up with them, to study best practices in 
other parts of the of the country and um, I understand the concern uh, the deep concern and uh, you know sort of horrifying nature of what people are seeing in terms of homelessness but I don't think it's because the strategies are wrong um, I think that asking our providers now uh, to participate in a four month long reassessment of each of these 47 strategies would take them away at a time that is so critical where we're trying to transition from Project Room Key to Project Home Key, where we're dealing with uh, the case overseen by Judge Carter and uh, just a lot of back and forth about that, where I know and understand that the COGS and the cities want a place at the table to say what should be, but they are not experts. They are essentially people, you know, like us, who want to use experts to come up with the best answer. And I, I think we had decided that we didn't want it to be so different from one city to the next. And that was the reason why having these existing 47 buckets created a lot of flexibility in ways to do things. I'm really concerned that this might lead us down a road where we might be tempted to abandon some of the best practices. Um, I disagree with my esteemed colleague about uh, the uh, percentage of those suffering from mental health issues uh, in the homeless population. Uh, in Hollywood, they just did their own count and they had shown that homelessness actually was 20% less than it had been the year before and related in many, many, many ways to losing a job and then losing your house or your apartment. So um, I do understand there will be some different ideas about what should be done, but I'm really worried about diverting all of the talent that is now focused on trying to find housing for people to go back into uh, a process that was rigorous and big and would have to be again. But I, I'm really afraid that this will divert our attention at just the wrong time. So I um, apologize, but cannot uh, support this. I, I would suggest if anyone would consider maybe giving them a little longer time to put all this together if, uh, if the rest of you are for this, um, something that might help us continue to do what we're trying to do for homeless people as we go along. Thank you, Madam Chair. You. Supervisor Hahn, which is wishes to be recognized. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I, I am pleased to to, to be the co-author with Supervisor Barger uh, on bringing this motion forward. And um, I certainly hear Supervisor Kuehl your concerns. And I, I wanted to start by saying, you know, these forty-seven strategies clearly were. Um, created before I came on the board. And I, I think I told you, Supervisor Kuehl, that I, that was key, by the way, in passing, in my opinion, Measure H, uh, particularly uh, when sometimes uh, we've gotten criticized. Uh, I, I know we were criticized in the city council in Los Angeles for putting forth, uh, you know, ballot measures a, a, without a, a concrete plan in place on how to spend money and you know uh, the media loves to criticize saying why don't you have a plan in place first before you ask the taxpayers uh, to spend their money so I think these 47 strategies being in place uh, in 2015 uh, before we put this on the ballot was key uh, to to the voters uh, to the critics that we had a strategy on how we were going to spend the taxpayer dollars if, in fact, Measure H passed. Uh, but I am uh, of the feeling right now uh, that we're half we're approaching the halfway point of Measure H, which was only uh, going to be in effect for 10 years. I think that's always the scary part of putting a ballot measure before the voters with a sunset clause, because more than likely the problem won't be solved in whatever time 
we we say, for instance, 10 years, we probably all knew that homelessness would not get solved in 10 years, and yet uh, to gain support, uh, uh, you know, from a, from a, a wide variety of, of uh, stakeholders, I, I think the sunset clause uh, is what uh, got put in place. But, you know, I, I just feel like we're going to run out of time, and I'm not sure the voters would approve something like this again. Uh, so I know personally I've heard from my cogs, from my constituents, and as much as we know that we're, it's working, as much as that we know we are making progress, as much as we know, um, yes, more people are falling into, into homelessness than we're able to house, we're still housing uh, a lot more people than we used to, I think the feeling among the, the public in LA County is something's not working, it does feel like it's getting worse, um, you know, I, I know we're all concerned when the the uh, eviction moratorium is lifted. What's that? What is that going to mean to pushing people to the streets? Um, and I just felt like this was the right time to reevaluate those 47 strategies, particularly since 21 of them are funded through Measure H. Is it a, is it time to just kind of make sure uh, you know they're as good as they can be? I think we have some new ideas about uh, housing people. I think, uh, uh, as you said, we ha we have been uh, you know working with um, Judge Carter. I think he's ruling that uh, Skid Row has to be cleaned up and emptied by this fall. So I feel like there's uh, a, a, some more urgency to what we're doing with the taxpayer dollars on trying to end homelessness. I know the mayor yesterday made a bold announcement that the city of LA will be uh, dedicating a billion dollars uh, to solve homelessness. So I just feel like it's the time and, and the public needs to know that we're not stuck in a rut on any of these strategies. Like if, if they're not working, if we can strengthen them, maybe some of them do need more money, then this is the time to look at it. But I, I, I certainly, uh, you know, don't like the idea of pulling uh, our our ad our advocates our our uh, contractors you know into just a study when we want them to be doing the real work. Um, and if you know, I would certainly be open to the idea of giving them a little bit longer than four months. Um, Supervisor Barger, I don't know if you'd be interested in maybe a six month timeline just to spread it out a little bit more. So uh, maybe that. Uh, uh, lessens the idea that they're spending all their time for a four-month study. I certainly would be open to that, but I do believe this is the right time to evaluate these strategies. Um, we have a new, uh, you know, director uh, at LASA, um, and I'm gonna, I'm definitely going to support this. I'm totally not stuck to the four-month report back. If we if six months feels better, I know we probably don't get your support on that, Supervisor Kuehl, but I think that was a, a good suggestion nevertheless. So I'm going to support this. Um, I think the public needs to know that we're constantly moving, looking, being flexible, recreating, reimagining. Uh, we've got five years on the taxpayer's dime uh, to really – um, to, to solve this problem. And I know I'm all in and, and I know my colleagues are all in on that as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would say, um, I would be happy to amend it to say up to six months um, okay. because I, I know that okay. um, you I'll know, six months, that. they take six months up to and ho hopefully- Yeah, because emergency. I'm probably gonna ask for an extension anyway, Supervisor. <laughs> so they do all the time, yep. Okay, thank you. Great, okay, next we'll hear first from Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to say that I, that I, you know, agree that it's important to have timely evaluation of, of any program, but particularly this program, in order to adjust um, as necessary and appropriate. Um, I think the assessment of Measure H outcomes really must lead to alleviating the challenges that people are facing who are experiencing homelessness. It cannot be a roadblock. And so, you know, I think I appreciate the up to six months, but I think we need to be really clear that this evaluation cannot drag on um, if um, it is truly going to inform a direction shift uh, in terms of what we should do. You know, I appreciate I too hear from constituents constituents about the perception of it getting worse. And 
And, and I think it is. And it's not getting worse because the government isn't stepping up to the plate. We are at a historic level. The reality is conditions in which lead to people being unhoused um, haven't stopped. And so with every day with 200 people being housed, another 227 find themselves unhoused. And so with that said, I also think it's important that we ensure that we are centering people experiencing homelessness in our priorities and that they be engaged in a meaningful, honest way in the evaluation. You know, if the county is, is, has purchased you know, for example, 10 motels to help our uh, Operation Room Key singles and families transition into Operation Home Key. And so they should be a part of the process of talking about what their experience was, if that worked, and, 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 and if, if, if it didn't. So I'd really like to encourage um, that, again, the voices of lived experience be amplified and, and that perhaps the CEO could develop or utilize spaces and tools which can be easily accessed by our residents who've directly benefited from these programs so they too can weigh in on a timely evaluation and one that will not be a roadblock to ongoing progress, success, and ultimately aiding people in finding housing. Appreciate it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh I also want to thank Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Hahn for introducing the motion. Uh, we've had long discussions regarding uh, Measure H and how many of our cities have uh, tried to tackle and some that have not tackled this issue appropriately, in my opinion. Even though we, we received support from all of our cities uh, and they agreed to work with us, I know that we still have much more work to do. I'm happy that in some places we were able to use use innovative programs such as Project Room Key and even Home Key. And I would say a good portion of those facilities are in the first district. Um, but I'd like to see more cities participating uh, other than just the city of, of Los Angeles or just the few handful that I've been able to work with. And um, that's why I wanna present a motion here, not a motion, an amendment to the motion. And it would read as follows. Uh, and I hope you per perceive it as a friendly amendment. Therefore, I move that the report back include recommendations to increase our city's participation in each strategy and strengthen opportunities for cities to augment Los Angeles County's investment in interim and permanent housing solutions within their city boundaries for residents experiencing homelessness. And the reason I bring this up is because I know many of you have seen what has happened in some cases where we've had cities opposing uh, any, any um, projects that we might have been looking at to partner with them. We've seen protests. We've even gone through litigation uh, because people did not want to, to work with us. But uh, for some reason, we were able to make some progress. I'd like to see more made. And if this goes forward, I really do want to see how we can strengthen the involvement of our cities and also people with lived experience. I think those are very important elements. So if you accept this as a friendly amendment, you know, I, I support uh, where you're going uh, with this uh, as well, um, Supervisor Barger and Hahn. I absolutely do accept it. I think, um, Supervisor Hahn, I don't think you have a problem with that as well. I think it's, um, uh, it complements it very well. I do too, I'm fine with it. I, I just uh, hadn't hadn't read it or hadn't hadn't seen it yet. So, but yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's compliment. And then are we also gonna codify the, maybe up to the six months as well? Yes, so we'll, okay. we'll accept that and then um, up to six months report back. Okay, so uh, if there's if there's no uh, other comments to be to be made, then then this item is before us, and this is uh, item 43C. So uh, can we please have uh, this is moved by Barger, seconded by Han, by Han, Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. 43C as amended. Uh, is before you, Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? No. Supervisor Kuehl, no. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries, order one. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, members, now we'll move on to item number 43G. 
employee paid leave for expanded vaccine access. And I held that item after I would ask uh, Supervisor Kuehl uh, to make remarks uh, also. Um, first, I wanna thank Supervisor Kuehl for co-authoring the motion with me. Uh, now that all residents age 16 and above in LA County are eligible to be vaccinated, we are in what I hope will be the final stages of the pandemic. But in order to reach the finish line, we must remove as many barriers to access as possible so that everyone, regardless of their race, ethnicity, zip code, or occupation, has the ability to access these life-saving vaccines. And in workplaces across the county, many employees lack the financial means to take the necessary time off from work to access vac vaccination sites. And this is especially true for low-wage and essential workers who had to uh, really bear the brunt of the health and financial impacts. Through gaps in our initial vaccine response are beginning to decrease, the disparities still remain, especially as we heard earlier from Dr. Ferrer amongst the Black and Latinx men. We know that many are overrepresented in our frontline jobs, including food preparation, farm workers, and construction workers. While these essential workers have been eligible for over a month, the disparities remain, so it's clear that much, much more has to be done. And although the county has deployed mobile units directly to workplaces to administer the vaccine, the capacity is limited. We also must prioritize other populations like senior housing centers, homebound individuals, and highly impacted areas and neighborhoods with low access to transportation. Not only must we do more to bring vaccines to workers, but we must make it easier for workers to access the vaccine. We should not be asking our workers, many of them essential, to decide between a vaccine that will save their lives and foregoing a paycheck they need to put food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. And although the federal and state legislation like the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act and SB 95 exist that provide some benefits for COVID related leave, we must be mindful that many of our essential workers were at greater risk and are, and are more likely to have already exhausted their existing benefits. That's why I'm introducing the motion for County Council to put together an ordinance that would grant all employees in businesses located in unincorporated areas of the county with up to four hours of additional paid leave for vaccinations. Early estimates indicate this would benefit over 216,000 employees working in the unincorporated areas of the county. The benefits would be retroactive to January 1st of this year, so anyone who already took time off would be reimbursed the, the time. This is not only the right thing to do from a public health perspective, but I also think that uh, it will help accelerate our vaccination efforts al already. Uh, as we can see, it is it's very much needed in communities of color. As the county reopens, ensuring workers are vaccinated will also provide greater assurances to patrons that businesses are safe to visit again and restoring greater consumer confidence in returning to a regular uh, economic activity. And I know that it will help us meet the governor's goal of fully reopening the county and the state, hopefully by June 15. I wanna thank you. And I also at this time would like to recognize Supervisor Kuehl for serving as a co-author for additional remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think it's really ironic that the business that stayed open every minute through, through the pandemic, the grocery stores, um, the UFCW reported that 80% of their members were not able to get vaccinated because of scheduling con constraints and not being allowed to take time off to access vaccines. So um, this is really a very welcome motion. Thank you for letting me co-author it. Um, I think it's also important that the uh, paid leave would be under our ordinance granted at their regular pay rate and not charged against any other paid leave that they're entitled to. And that I think is very important. I think it. we asked the uh, uh, County Council to get it back to us pretty quickly, I think for the next meeting, but also to, to um, ascertain whether the ordinance can be applied to all of our private employers um, in the unincorporated areas, looking at any constraints of other laws saying that only certain size businesses, because I think we can, uh, should be able to and probably can legally apply this to all businesses. And I think that would be appropriate. So um, I wanna thank the uh, CEO staff, um, 
for their help in uh, working through some of this and um, really, really hope this can lead to greater vaccination rates among workers. So thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, are you there? Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Um, are there any other members that wish to be recognized on this item? I don't see anyone. Uh, um, yes, ma yes, Madam Chair. Um, Supervisor, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. Mitchell. Yes, I just, I'll be supportive of the motion. I just, it, it's something that occurred to me and I wanted to ask you a clarifying question if it could be considered as the um, final language is being considered. When I think about all that we are hearing from medical experts and, 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 and you know, constituents around vaccine reluctancy, mm -hmm. um, many of the primary vaccine reluctancy issues center around side effects that people have heard that others have had, you know, particularly around the second shot. And so I'm wondering if the four hours kind of includes if you've had a negative reaction if, if in your mind, the four hours was really just the time to go and get the vaccine. So I just wanted to, to, to put that out there and kind of ask the question because it, that continues to be a primary issue that's elevated around reasons for vaccine reluctancy. You know, I hadn't thought about it in that manner, but I do understand what you're saying. I think we can ask County Council to help us craft something that could help meet that. Uh, or if, or if this if this amount of time is sufficient for that, because I know that typically for some people they have that adverse reaction and they may be out the next day, so it could it could maybe go maybe to six days possibly, but that's something that I would ask uh, for a, to be included in our report, you know, back uh, in working with the county council on that. I do appreciate you mean that. hours. Do you mean days? What did, can I you? I think she meant out. I'm assuming she meant hours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we can ask the county council to look at that. So I don't Thank have you. I don't have a problem with that. So Thank you very much. Any okay? So if there aren't any other uh, questions from members, then this item, uh, as amended, or will be uh, before us. Uh, I move, seconded by Supervisor Kuhl, to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Forty-three G is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, members. Um, members, at this time, I wanted to bring uh, something to our attention that uh, will require an urgency vote. And I wanted to bring this uh, item to us under motion A7, uh, and it uh, has to deal with uh, dealing with the uh, expedited manner that's before us right now. And I think we talked about this, I think, at our last meeting with respect to LA, LA County's duty to address the humanitarian crisis affecting unaccompanied children. I think uh, Supervisor Barger had, had a motion and I previously had motions to address this. So I'd like to, to bring this up before uh, the board, if we might, because it, it is rather timely, and like to read in the following. Uh, colleagues, I know uh, the United States has been met, as you know, with the crisis of significant proportion that I believe requires all of us to respond. Young people escaping poverty, persecution on the basis of religion, gender, sexual orientation, gang violence, and other life-threatening situations are coming to the United States for refuge. Their situation is often so untenable that they must make the dangerous journey despite the unknown. And unfortunately, the number of young people in the situation is only growing. And although Los Angeles County may not be a border town, its role in responding to the crisis is clear. LA County is a place of compassion. The robust network of nonprofit organizations, county safety net agencies, healthcare providers, caring residents clearly define LA County's role in responding to the humanitarian crisis. 
Los Angeles County is prepared to do whatever possible to ease transition of these children once they come to Los Angeles County and allow them to recover from the trauma that no young person should have to endure. That extends to our county departments, such as departments of health services, DHS, Children and Family Services, DCFS, Mental Health, DMH, Public Health, DPH, Los Angeles County Office of Education, LACO, and the Office of Immigrant Affairs, OIA. For example, DHS services may include the provision of health assessments, vaccinations, and ongoing medical care and medications for children with underlying health conditions provided both on site and by referral by DHS facilities when needed. DMH can also offer a range of mental health services through its promotoras, psychologists, cognitive behavior therapists, and other clinicians. DCFS is prepared to provide family reunification and case management support, and LACO is, pre is prepared to provide educational support through curriculum development and learning resources. OIA, as you know, has expertise, which is also significant uh, when it comes to family reunification, legal services, and other supports that these young people are entitled to receive. And although the exact scope and terms of the county departmental services are still under development, everything possible, in my opinion, must be solidified in an expedited manner to not further delay the transition of these youth out of border detention facilities and into the care of their loved ones. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors authorize the Chief Executive Office and County Council to one, work with the United States Health and Human Services or other relevant federal departments or contractors to leverage all available federal resources to address this humanitarian crisis and to partner with HHS or other relevant federal departments or contractors as needed to mobilize the county resources for this effort. Number two, to work with relevant county departments and delegate authority to the chief executive officer or her designees to enter into any necessary contracts and memorandum of understanding, amend any existing contracts except available funding and to leverage all necessary funding from the federal government to ensure unaccompanied children receive necessary services while in Los Angeles County. That concludes the motion and I urge my colleagues I vote I see uh, that there, uh, Supervisor Hahn uh, would also like to join. Yes, I'd like to co-author with you, uh, Madam Chair, particularly because, um, you know, uh, the Long Beach Convention Center in my district, of course, is now going to be welcoming uh, immigrant children. Uh, and I, I and one of the things the mayor reached out to me was to make sure that our county resources were uh, you know, really geared up and ready to support. I know there's going to be a facility in Pomona, so I would love to co-author this with you. I think it's so important at this time when these um, children come that we're ready to support them. Thank you. Uh, I have no problem adding you as a co-author. I know you're uh, uniquely also situated there in Long Beach. Let me just make a correction. This is not an urgency item. This is brought to us under motion under A7, items uh, that uh, have continued from previous meetings. So it's appropriate to, to take this matter up now. I now want to recognize Supervisor Kuehl, who's requested to be recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have sort of two questions um, uh, about the language. Uh, one is, although I certainly recognize that everything we would do, and I'm certain that our CEO would do, and our departments would include this, but at the end of the second directive, where it says receive necessary services, I'm just thinking about past history, and I wonder if we could add, and I'm just making this up, so if you've got a better idea, that's fine, safe, comma, appropriate and necessary services. Um, I, I don't know whether council uh, would object because it puts another set of requirements, but I'd be happy to hear because I want it, you know, I want us to be um, devoted to the safety and appropriate mm -hmm. treatment of the kids. Um, so right. just as a consideration, if Rod doesn't say it's a bad thing, to well, add safe, safe, comma, appropriate and necessary. Safe and appropriate. 
Uh, is County Council on? Can we? Yeah, yes, uh, Supervisor. Uh, I don't see a, a, an issue with that, a legal issue with including that language. Okay. okay. The other question I had, and I'm not certain where it goes, is I'm extremely concerned that we participate, if it's appropriate, in helping uh, or requiring the feds to do everything they can to find family. Uh, we have really, really ramped up our family finding uh, in mm -hmm. DCFS and it's made an enormous difference right. and you have indicated in the preamble um, that uh, you know it says not not to further delay the transition of youth out of those facilities and into the care of their loved ones but I don't know whether there's anything in the directives that would say that we would also work with uh, HHS or other relevant federal departments um, you know, not that we would necessarily be responsible for the finding, but I don't know if there's a place where it might be appropriate to underscore that as a part of our care. Well, I think that uh, one thing that we have been doing is uh, Bobby Cagle has been uh, involved in all these uh, discussions, and he's actually given a lot of good advice and recommendations to HHS already, which they are ready to undertake. So I really do feel like that we're going to have a good, uh, a better effort and approach than other parts of the country have in dealing with this issue because one of our priorities will make sh will be sure to make sure that we find sufficient uh, guardian uh, representation and especially ability for foster foster care and as well as adoption and I know that Bobby Cagle is very uniquely engaged in this and has been already so if, is that is that okay I mean well I sure I mean I trust that I uh, and if it's better not to write it into the directive, um, but I think it's really an emphasis I'd like us to have, and I know you feel that way too. We probably yes. all do. I mean, yeah. we see this as transitional. We don't want them living at the fairplex, you know, for years. No, um, no. So uh, if that's taken for granted, and I, I guess if we see that there's any lag, we can always kind come of come back. back and say, and I really mean it, right? And and I think uh, our CEO has been working very diligently with us on this too and understands that a whole part of this will be continually working and monitoring what our departments are doing. So those questions can come up anytime and we could certainly monitor that. And and we will because it's going to be essential. Uh, okay. So absolutely. If that's thank, okay. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support this. Okay, great. Are there any other questions from members? on this item okay if we do not see any further then um then i will go ahead and move the item as amended adding supervisor on as a co-author and also making clear that we will uh clarify uh the safety uh, what was it the safe safe and appropriate care of children and then we'll also encourage our encourage our CEO to make sure that um, our departments are doing everything they can to help us uh, provide the best uh, care and placement for these for these young people. So with that, uh, I will move, seconded by Han, to approve the item as amended. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. This item to add Supervisor Han as a co-author and add under Directive 2 to include safe, only as appropriate and necessary services. Um, which is under A7 is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carried five to zero. Thank you very much, members. I appreciate that. Um, at this time now, it would be appropriate to hear adjournments. And we're going to begin with Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Lewis Wilder Jr., who was only 67 when he passed away. Um, he attended Long Beach Poly High School and worked for the City of Long Beach Technology Services for 25 years. Lewis was Long Beach through and through. And his motto was, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. For all who knew him, Lewis was the epitome of personality and positivity. He was an avid golfer and loved traveling and having fun. He spent the last 16 years enjoying life to the fullest with his wife, Connie. 
The outpouring of condolences from across the city underscores what an impact Lewis had on so many communities in Long Beach. He was truly beloved by everyone. He was survived by his mother, Stella Wilder, his children, Lewis Wilder III, Travis Wilder, Peter Benjamin, Daisy Benjamin, brothers Ricky, Spencer, and Tracy Wilder, and two grandchildren whom he loved immensely. And uh, Madam Chair, I also want to join you uh, in a journey for Vice President Walter Mondale. And if you would let me, after you um, make your remarks uh, when it's your time, I would love to, uh, to say a few things as well. I will Thank recognize you. you at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll go to Supervisor Barger. Thank you. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so a member uh, in, in memory of Rigoberto Archigia a resident of South Pasadena and a member of the county family who recently passed away at the age of 49. Rigo served for 20 years in the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office as a deputy district attorney. During his tenure, he represented clients in, in uh, the county. He was the president of the Mexican American Bar Association as well as president of the Latino Public Defenders Association. Rigo was the first in his family to obtain a college and a postgraduate degree. Before joining the Public Defender's Office, he was a school teacher in East Los Angeles. Rigo is survived by his wife, Eva, children, Asael, and Sebastian, and a large extended family. Also that we adjourn in memory of Mark McKinley, who passed away peacefully in his home in Pasadena on March 12th at the age of 73. Born in Los Angeles, he attended St. Bede's Catholic School and St. Francis High School in La Cunada, and then the University of Southern California. At USC, he met the love of his life, Lori Dill, and they were married in 1969. Mark had a distinguished 14-year 14 14 career at Colwell Company, after which he found success as co-founder of Cypress Financial Corporation, president of Homes Direct, and founder of the software application company, Ecuador. Mark was active in the Pasadena chapter of the Young President's Organization, where he served as chapter chair. He also served as vice president of finance on the board of Kids Space Children's Museum in Pasadena, on the board of trustees for Flint Ridge Preparatory School, and as a member of the USC Marshall Board of Leaders, where he counseled students on career paths. When not spending time with his beloved family, Mark loved a round of golf or a game of cards with friends. Mark was a wonderful husband, father, grandfather, competitor, partner, and friend, and will be greatly missed. He survived by his wife of 52 years, Lori, and his three children, Shauna, Katie, and Robert, as well as six grandchildren. Also, in memory of Virginia Madeline de, de Serville Muller, known affectionately as Ginny, who passed away in her sleep on the morning of March 18th at the age of 91. Born in San Francisco, Ginny moved to Southern California in her youth and attended Westridge School of Girls in Pasadena and Mount Vernon College in Washington, D.C. She met George Muller on a double date and they married in 1954. They spent their 67 years of married life between Pasadena and Santa Barbara. Ginny was active in the Pasadena Junior League, Pasadena Guild of Children's Hospital, and Via Esperanza. She, she could always be found working at a polling place during many presidential elections, and she spent many years working for port call in the Antiques Department. Jenny was the kindest and most caring of individuals who touched the lives of all who knew her. She's survived by her husband of 67 years, George, their three daughters, Victoria, Robin, and Mary, her sister Mary, and six grandchildren. Also, that we adjourn a memory of Urbano Ramirez, a longtime resident of Valverde, who passed away at the age of 67. He was born in Elsa, Texas, as a sixth of 12 children. The family moved to Valverde in 1959, where they all worked in the surrounding agricultural fields. He joined the United States Army when he turned 18, and upon returning to civilian life, he attended automotive school and developed a lifelong passion for cars. He became the proud owner-operator of Bob's Body and Fender Repair, and for over 20 years, he lived his dream of being a business owner and a pillar in the automotive, ind automotive industry by mentoring and hosting many industry training events. After retiring from business ownership, he remained in the industry working for Mitchell International, 
where he was recognized as salesperson and sales executive of the year in 2020. Urbano was an active member and usher at Our Lady of Perpetual Help Catholic Church. He's survived by his wife, Allison, their three daughters, Sylvia, Rosie, uh, and Amanda, and 10 siblings. Also, that we adjourn in memory of George Root, former Lancaster mayor who passed away at the age of 90. Born in San Francisco, he entered the US Navy at 17 and became an aviation mechan me 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 mechanist mate. Discharged in San Diego, George went to work there for the General Dynamics Corporation as a mechanic. At General Dynamics, he worked on the Atlas rocket program and moved to the Antelope Valley to work at Edwards Air Force Base. George moved on to Northrop Corporation, then to Caltech's Jet Proportion Laboratory. At JPL, he advanced from mechanic to engineer to deputy faculty member of the JPL Edwards Test Station. While working for JPL, George designed and improved valve for space operations, which was granted a patent in 1972. President of the Friendly Village Mobile Home Park Owners Association in Lancaster, he was elected to the Lancaster City Council in 1990. George served until 1994, including two year-long terms as vice mayor and mayor, respectively. After his retirement, George continued to be active in the community. He could be seen eating breakfast at Cats and Jammers restaurant with the Grumpy Old Men's Club. He and his wife, Barbara, enjoyed cruises to the South Pacific, Alaska, and Scandinavia until her death in 2009. His survivors include his children, Terry, Gary and Jeff, four granddaughters and four great grandchildren. And last, I move that the Board of Supervisors adjourn, adjourn in memory of the following individuals who were identified as indigent veterans by the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner and were subsequently buried with dignity and honor at Riverside National Cemetery in the last month. Jean Francis Appleton, Navy, David Michael Altavia, Army, Roger Lee Andrews, Air Force, Brett Carter Davis, Army, Danny Garcia, Navy, Carlos Thomas Jones, Army, Edmund Leroy Lindsay, Army, Soon J. Lu, Army, Micaiah Earl Mitchell, Marine Corps, Nicholas Pasparis, Navy, Michael Riviera, Air Force, Roy Zuzek, Navy. May their contributions and sacrifices in service to our country never be forgotten. Those are my adjournments, Madam Chair very much i will go next i move that when we adjourn today we adjourn in memory of vince aguilar he dedicated over 30 years of service to the county of los angeles and was an employee at the transit section of the department of public works vince was a civil engineer he was 54 years of age at the time of his passing and was a beloved colleague son brother and uncle he had many different hobbies including photography fishing gardening hiking and playing the guitar. He lived in East Los Angeles and is survived by his parents, three brothers and six sisters who will miss him dearly. May he rest in peace. <clears throat> I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Walter Mondale. As we all know, former Vice President Mondale served under former President Jimmy Carter from 1977 until 1981. He passed away yesterday at his home in Minneapolis at the age of 93. I served in the White House Office of Hispanic Affairs when he was Vice President in 1980, and later I had the honor of meeting him on a trip to Japan when I served in the California State Senate, and Vice President Mondale was the United States Ambassador to, to Japan at the time. When I served in the Obama administration, he remained on the, in the political realm, continuing his service to the country as an advisor to President Obama and as a mentor to many staffers within the administration. He was an early advocate for racial and economic justice and a progressive reformer who has been a party leader for a long time. He supported anti-poverty programs and notably affirmative action policies at a time when policies did not have widespread public support. He was also widely known as a full partner with President Carter and played key roles in many important policies. During his last hours, he was able to reach out to his friends, colleagues, and former staff to thank them for their enduring friendship. He was predeceased by his wife, Eleanor, and daughter, Joan. May he rest in peace. Supervisor Hahn, you've requested to say a few words as well. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad that you, that we are adjourning uh, today in memory of Fritz uh, Mondale. Uh, he had such a interesting career in, in public service. Uh, he had so many uh, great uh, attributes. He was a, a civil rights uh, fighter. Uh, unfortunately, his loss to President Reagan was so lopsided. Uh, he only won his state and the District of Columbia. The Electoral College was like 534 to 13 or something. It was so lopsided and it was so unfortunate because that was the first time uh, that a major presidential nominee, nominee chose a woman uh, to be his running mate. And Geraldine Ferraro was catapulted into, you know, uh, our ether uh, as being, you know, a woman who could be vice president and then, of course, could step in to be president of the United States if something happened to the president. I'll never forget, uh, my dad took me to the Long Beach airport when uh, Mondale and Ferrara were coming for one of their campaign swings through um, Los Angeles. And my dad thought uh, it was important for me to see up close and personal uh, the first woman uh, vice presidential nominee that we'd ever had in this country. So uh, my dad and Fritz were, were very close. And again, it was such a great historic um, campaign. And yet uh, he, he lost so big in that race. I think it was because he, he announced that he'd be raising taxes uh, if he got uh, elected and, and nobody uh, wanted that. But, um, you know, he had a he closed his 2010 memoir by saying, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Um, and uh, he, he was, we, we were lucky uh, to have um, Walter Mondale as a public servant in our lifetime. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of David H. Lewis. He was born on February the 5th, 1962 in Sunnyvale, California. Passed away on Saturday, March 27th, 2021 at the age of 61. He graduated high school in 1980 and relocated to Los Angeles County the same year to attend Azusa Pacific University where he received a master's in education. He spent over 30 years at Azusa High School working as a teacher, guidance counselor, and director of theater arts program there. He made the theater a safe space for so many students who did not always have the best situations at home. David Lewis is survived by the thousands of students who were positively impacted by his compassionate approach to education and a host of extended family members and friends who will miss him dearly. May he rest in peace. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Angelina Hernandez, a long time, a long term care worker with SEIU Local 2015. Angelina Hernandez was born in Guanajuato, Mexico in 1962. She immigrated to the United States over 40 years ago in pursuit of a better life for her family. Angelina worked different jobs in various industries for many years. She then quit her job as she faced the responsibility of caring for her brother who became disabled. Through that experience, Angelina became an IHSS worker through the encouragement of her SEIU Local 2015 family. Angelina became active in issues affecting her members. During every election, she served as a demo uh, democracy captain where she traveled to Sacramento to advocate for 400,000 long-term care workers. She played a key role in engaging and empowering other SEIU 2015 members. Angelina was resilient and a light to many. On April 9th, she lost her battle with COVID-19. She survived by her three siblings, Rogelio, Margarita, and Ramon. May she rest in power. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Edwin Aguilar. He was born in El Salvador in 1974 and grew up amidst the country's civil war. He eventually fled the conflict at the age of nine and settled in East Los Angeles. Against all odds, Edwin avoided gangs in his neighborhood and went on to attend art school on a scholarship to study animation. He worked his way up at animation companies, honing his art until he got his big break to work on The Simpsons in 1998, eventually becoming an assistant director on the show. His colleagues say he is the glue that held the show together for many years. Edwin was a role model to many, and his artistry will live on in the minds of millions around the country. 
He's survived by his wife and three children. May he rest in peace. <clears throat> I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Juana Cicada Solis. She was born on June 5th, 1926 in Hinotega, Nicaragua. She was the eldest of five children. She immigrated to the United States in 1945 when she was just 19 years of age. Lived in New Orleans, Louisiana for five years before moving to Los Angeles, California, where she met my father, Raul Solis, while attending an English language class. They married in 1953 and soon moved to the city of La Puente, California. She was married to him for 58 years until his passing in 2012. My mother taught me everything I know about hard work, the value of education, and most importantly, the need to have compassion for others. She was a devout Roman Catholic who instilled in her children with the value of service to others. Even though we didn't have much, she always looked out for the community. She wasn't wealthy, but she lived a rich life, leaving behind a small village of friends who will honor her legacy. She was uh, my rock, not just to me, but to my siblings. And she was a support system throughout my life, and especially during campaigns for elected office. She'd stay late in the night stuffing envelopes and even walking precincts and cooking her delicious arroz con pollo for volunteers and campaign staff. Cooking was her love language. It was her way of showing her care and affection for those around her. Later, later in life, my mother enjoyed the simple things such as celebrating birthdays and holidays with friends and family. She was able to meet several U.S. dignitaries, such as former President Barack Obama, President Joe Biden, and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden while I served in the cabinet and worked in the Congress. She touched so many lives in her own way, and now I'm glad she's once again reunited with my father, my sister, Dr. Beatrice Solis, and survived by my six of her seven children, Irma, Roel Jr., myself, Victor, Anna, Leticia, and her 10 grandchildren, and 23 great-grandchildren. Dios la bendiga, mom. You'll always be loved and truly never forgotten. Thank you. Supervisor Q. All Hilda. members. Hilda, we would all be yes. here right now. Yes. I hope you know that. I mean, this is so awful Sorry. just to be so separated. And, of course, we've all lost our moms, so we're right. all, like, you know. So, we all, yeah, we all want to be on this one with you, Hilda. Thank yes. you. And we're, we're around your chair right now. Just really imagine it, okay? Thank you. Okay. I think Holly's I apologize nice. for that. <laughs> Okay, Supervisor Mitchell. I'm sorry. Supervisor Mitchell. Madam Chair, you owe no one an apology, and your leadership honors your mother every day. Amen. I ask that we adjourn in the memory of Captain Brian Levasseur, a 32-year veteran of the Los Angeles County Fire Department. He passed away at his home in Simi Valley uh, this past March at the very young age of 52. He was born August of 1968 at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica. He attended Santa Monica High as well as Santa Monica College. Captain Levasseur will be remembered for his great courage and skill as well as his dedication to the safety of the residents of LA County. He worked at some of the county's busiest fire stations. For the past five years of his active duty, he served in the city of Inglewood. He was a proud member of LA County Firefighters Union Local 1014. He was known to be a mentor and trained many firefighters in the department. He was very personable to his colleagues and was known for his sense of humor. He was a deep sea fisherman, a golfer, a hiker, and was a renowned girl's dad to his daughter, Kaylee. In addition to his beloved daughter, he leaves behind to cherish his memory, his mother, Kathleen, <clears throat> his mother, Kathleen, his father, Bill, and former wife, Casey, as well as many colleagues and friends in the fire department, 
he will truly be missed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Kuehl, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Ann Beats, a, ground a groundbreaking uh, and raking comedy writer. Um, starting in 1975, she was among a small team of very gifted writers who helped make Saturday Night Live a cultural phenomenon. But drawing on her own life experience as an outsider in high school, she created a series called Square Pegs that was quite a rare kind of sitcom in that it focused on teenage girls. The series was praised as a precursor for the teen comedies that John Hughes would later become famous for. Uh, Beat's other credits included writing for Murphy Brown, uh, The Bells of Bleecker Street, she produced A Different World, and she uh, helped to write the stage musical, Leader of the Pack. She survived by her daughter, Jaylene, and her sister, Barbara. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of uh, an actress and friend, Gloria Elwood, who played the effervescent mother on the TV series, Dennis the Menace. Gloria Elwood, under her stage name, Gloria Henry, became a lovable figure in living rooms across America. And after stepping away from Hollywood, she became a PTA monk, an arts patron, uh, supporting LA's theaters and museums and the opera. When Dorothy Chandler, whose husband Norman, who was then publisher of the Times, asked for her help, she feverishly raised funds so that school children could attend performances at the Amundsen and the Mark Taper. She remained an active member of the Center Theater Group Volunteers for more than 50 years and was also a longtime docent at the LA Zoo. She's survived by her children, Jeff, Aaron, and Adam. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Dr. Jerry Kozai, who died on February 12th. After receiving his doctor of pharmacy degree, he worked as a clinical pharmacist for several years, but he felt that his true calling was tackling some of the more wide reaching issues in healthcare. And from this realization, he eagerly became passionate about the need to address the social and economic barriers that prevent so many from accessing quality care. So in 1989, Jerry's cause for change began when he joined St. Francis Medical Center. After harnessing various roles, he grew into a great leader as the president and CEO and created monumental progress within the healthcare landscape. In addition to his 40 years of experience in the healthcare industry, he served on multiple boards, including the Hospital Council of Southern California Board of Directors and the Community Health Council. He also constructed many programs and policies that helped bring care to the marginalized populations of LA and would often travel to Washington, DC to advocate uh, about the need for trauma centers in underserved areas. He survived by his wife, Kathy, and his children, Kendall and Cassidy. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Michael Trainen, uh, LA Sheriff's deputy who died on April 6th. He actually began working for the county in 1989 and he retired last year. During his time at the county, he worked at the Hall of Justice, the North County Correctional Facility, Pitch's Honor Ranchero South Facility, East LA Station, uh, started on patrol and was promoted to training officer. Malibu Lost Hills Station, where he was a beloved field training officer for deputy trainees and deputy reserves, and also the station's homeless outreach deputy. He survived by his wife, Sharon. And finally, I move that we adjourn in memory of a guy that I actually met in junior high school, went to um, Audubon and Dorsey with Howard Weitzman who was a Hollywood attorney and died on April 3rd. A Hollywood power lawyer, whose client list included almost every studio, CAA, William Morris Agency, all the major agencies, as well as a long list of stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Britney Spears, Sean Diddy Combs, and many more. He was the lead attorney in more than 300 civil, civil and criminal jury trials and represented more than 1,000 individuals and companies 
on matters like intellectual property, entertainment law, family law, and estate law. He taught trial advocacy at USC's law school for 12 years. He lectured at Harvard, the Georgetown University Law Center, and UCLA. He was named one of the top 15 lawyers in the country by the National Law Journal and twice received the Jerry Geisler Memorial Award for Outstanding Trial Lawyer in LA County. He survived by his wife, Maggie, and his sons, Jed and Armen, and many of his friends are starting a scholarship at Dorsey High for him, for students who may be interested in going to law school. Those are my adjournments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We will take all motions as seconded, and if there's no objection to a unanimous vote, that will be the action. We will continue item CS1 and CS2 one week to April 27, 2021. If there are no objections, that will be the order. Uh, that concludes today's meeting, members. The next meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be a special closed session on Tuesday, April 27, 2021. The next regular meeting of the Board will be held on Tuesday, May the 4th, 2021. Thank you, and that is our adjournment. Thank you to all and the public. Thank, thank you. you. It's a good day for justice. Yes, thank Definitely. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.